When I was in school, it was the overhead projector with the the crank, but then we had to clean. Do you guys know that thing? Did you ever have that thing? Like the overhead projector where it had the the roll of the clear stuff, and you rolled it. Oh yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is like whatever. Did you? I, I graduated next year. Oh, 2001? That's when I graduated from high school. And in case you didn't feel old already, that's the year that the incoming freshman class of 2019 were born. <laughs> Every time I look, like when we get incoming students and I look at like academic, whatever, and I'm like, you're born in 2001. Oh my God, I graduated from high school. Are you even like my friends were like, no. Like they born in like, uh, no, actually they, when they, uh, when they were like, um, at uh, elementary school in 2003, so the, the year I get married, like, oh my god. <laughs> but you know what's good? You look like you're 23 right <laughs> <laughs> Hi, hi. Come on in, there's a sign-in sheet right there, and if you would just grab, um, whatever is over there. <laughs> Jordy, that um, that's good on the screen, right? Yes. What? Why did I get a slow rider? What the heck? I think if you like hold it, it's a case. I don't know. Okay, this is like. Hi, Austin. Thank you so much for doing that. Yes, thank you. Were you delivering that to me? Thank you. I've never been to this one. Yeah. Thank you so much. I've never been to the snow. Would you like it? Oh, oh. Yeah. I know. I know. I can say I've been to the snow. I've never been to the snow. No. Absolutely. I've never been to the snow. No. Yeah, I'd rather go to the snow. True. I'd rather go to the snow. Which is good, right? Oh, thank you for doing that. Also. That's awesome. And then I think Jordan's gonna ask you but you'll come in and we'll like finish this up. Yeah, if you yeah. wouldn't mind. Whatever. Whatever. No, she'll ask. Whatever. she'll ask you about it. To do the online thing. Yeah. 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 All it is is just um just anything about family. Yeah. 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 And the live feed when she's done for I have to go home and like I have a guy meeting me to look at my bathroom so we can finish my we always have bathtub. Um so yeah, it'll be me around like eleven thirty ish, eleven forty five ish. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Austin. So if you'll notice, they're all written up. Like everyone's kind of like, oh, <laughs> and Ellie's going like this with the bar pedal. And I was like, well, like, there's some different. I'm like, I don't know what you're doing. No, because you're this, you're actually, like, I said, I'm going to go ask me, what do you want to do? 
All right, well, let's hope this goes well. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just saying that because I changed the thing. And so you guys are my uh, test. No, I, I think it'll be good. Um, For some reason, the kids ask more about dating than children. How many people were supposed to be here? I guess it doesn't matter because it might be different. Yeah, you're Okay. Okay. Okay, I can't do all I hate technology. <laughs> all right, well, I guess I'll go ahead and get started because it's you guys are here. I mean, we it said there were going to be 25 people here, but it's okay if, if not, if people come in. Um, so did, going over there too. Oh, what? They may be going over there so we might get Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. That's true. Good point. Did everyone pick up one of these packets? Yeah. Um, if you didn't, they're right over there. Um, you got one? Oh, yeah. I it was mine's a different the key. One. Uh, yeah, mine's see, the key. Was. Don't try and look, okay? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I remembered it. I've forgotten it before, but I'm like, well, I, if I don't know the answers, what am I? I probably need to look. So um, anyway, um, so I was just telling Caleb, right? Yes. I was just telling Caleb that the English language skills section, maybe you've taken it already, maybe you haven't, uh, but it's not just English language skills, right? We're going to break it down into three subsections. Uh, if you've taken the exam and you have your score report, your like third page of it, well, it depends on the sections, but um, it's going to give you a breakdown of your scores on each competency. So for example, competency one, which is knowledge of language structure, has 10 questions. Your score report is going to show you the number of correct questions you got on that competency. Let's say you didn't take the exam yet, but you've taken the practice exam that Jordan gave you when you registered. On the answer key, that is also that is also categorized by competency. So you can calculate it on your own, right? I say that to say as we're going through, that will help you to identify areas to target your study. The least effective way to study is to just get a prep book and start on page one. Do, do, do. Because you might be spending an hour focused on something that you know that you've got every question correct on. You know, so as we're going through my advice to you, because um, we're going to go competency one, skill one, explanation, practice problem, competency one, skill two, explanation, practice problem. If we're going through and you're like, what is this? I need more help. Put some sort of notation in the margin of the paper because I'm going to send you all additional information when you leave here. So I'm going to send you. Hi, welcome. There's a sign in sheet and some things to pick up right over there. Um, I'm going to send you literally a, an email that's going to say competency one, skill one, and it's going to have a link. So it's going to give you another explanation of what I described, um, maybe heard from a different person in a different way. Because I think we all know that sometimes one person can explain something and it clicks, and sometimes we need to hear it in a little bit of a different way to really understand it, right? Um, so... If, as we're going through, if you've taken the exam and you have questions, you're like, wait, is this how this was presented? This is what this question was, right? Let me know, because I think other people in the room would likely benefit from that, right? Um, so, uh, and feel free to interrupt, ask questions as you want. I'll write some things down, but by and large, this is your visual, and um, I, I hope, my hope is that auditorily you can, you're a good processor, because I talk a lot. Hi, welcome. There's a sign-in sheet right over there, and if you could grab um, one of the uh, one of each of the sheets, that would be fantastic. Okay, so the first competency is called knowledge of language structure. When I think of structure, I usually think of an engineer, 
right? So I'm not an engineer. I'm very far from an engineer, but I know engineers build things, right? So every day I drive over the Howard Franklin Bridge and I know that ed that engineers, hi, welcome. If you could just sign in and grab one of each of those, that'd be great. They, they build things, right? And they decided the order in which certain things need to be placed in order for that structure to be sound, right? Whether it's a bridge, whether it's a building, whether it's just city planning, all of those things. The same is true and necessary in our, um, in our language, right? So sometimes it's the order of words in a sentence. Sometimes it's the order of sentences in a paragraph, right? When we mix those up, our structure isn't sound, and we need to make sure that it is. The first skill within knowledge of language structure has to do with modifiers. We have to evaluate the correct placement of modifiers. So what the heck's a modifier? A modifier is something that just gives more detail or explanation about something, right? What happens is if we have it in the wrong spot, we have what's called a misplaced modifier. And the meaning of the sentence is muddy. It's not what we're supposed to say, right? Or it's not what we think we're saying. So do you see where I have example A bolded? He saw a truck in the driveway that was red and black. Red and black is our modifier. What's red and black? Read the sentence one more time. He had he saw a truck in the driveway that was red and black. It literally says driveway that was red and black, but we allowed our brain to think, well, who paints your driveway red and black? So here's the key. Do you, do you ever have a, a teacher who gave you like a quiz about um, and the, to stress the importance of reading directions? And you wouldn't read the directions. And, and then, then and yes, and at the end, it's like, you're looking around, you're like, well, how's that freak done already? Like, what? I'm trying to do the, the you know, square root of my social security number. And this person's, you know, and it's like the directions say, answer only question one, which was like, sign your name. Or what's your birthday or something like that. Read the directions. I understand that you're under a time constraint when you take this exam. But reading the directions is going to help you. Because for modifiers, the directions literally say, choose the sentence in which the modifier is correctly placed. And once you read that, I want you to think of one thing, proximity. Modifiers are close to what they're modifying. So when we read that sentence, he saw a truck in the driveway that was red and black. That's wrong because red and black right now is close to driveway. So let's change it. He saw a red and black truck in the driveway. Can you see the difference? So those, sometimes modifiers like a word or a couple of words, there's another type of modifier. It's called a limiting modifier. You don't have to know that terminology, but sometimes I'll, I'll bold those words or terms in here so that if you have questions when you leave, you know what to type into our friend Google, right? Um, but limiting modifiers are words like only, nearly, almost, and they limit or restrict what we're talking about, right? So if you look where it says example B, I only have $1 in my wallet. That means that if you hand me your wallet, if I say, Caleb, I need your wallet right now, you have a dollar bill in it. You don't have a driver's license. You don't have a credit card. You have nothing else because the word only there is modifying half. It's not modifying one dollar. So we have to switch it. Do I understand that this is like really crazy picky? 100% I do. I think, you know, I've said this morning, general is not easy. General is not something that is like, oh yeah, everybody learned that, right? I get it, it's broad, it's complex. But also, I just told you that when you read the directions, they're gonna say, choose the sentence in which the modifier is correctly placed, right? So you already know, modifier close. And I told you there are things called limiting modifiers, only, nearly, almost. So if you read the directions and it says, choose the sentence in which the modifier is correctly placed, and you're already thinking, okay, I gotta look for something, make sure it's in the right spot. And you see that word only. That should activate something in your brain that says that word needs to be right next to what it's modifying. So instead of saying, I only have $1, we're going to say, I have only $1. Now, only is right in front of $1, only $1. I get it. That's tricky. Some of these things, you know, I can give you like a trick for. Sometimes you just have to commit certain things to memory, right? So I, I only have $1. I have only $1. Only right there is right next to $1. You, you basically, you never only have anything. You don't see the word only in front of half. You should 
Okay. You do. You see it a lot, right? I think as we go through this, you're going to be like what people say all the time, myself included, like I'm certainly not perfect. And I, I have a really strong appreciation for this, but I screw stuff up. Right. So, but my hope is that you'll start to recognize those things and be like, Oh wait, that's how that should be. So the, sometimes modifiers are words, a couple of words, limiting modifiers. Other times they're whole phrases. They're called participial phrases, but essentially it's an entire phrase that modifies a part of a sentence. And we mess that up. And it, we're, oftentimes when we do that, we move, we give an action to something in the sentence that can't be taking an action. You know, it's called a misplaced modifier. So if you look at example C, advancing across the desolate plains, that's our modifier, right? Advancing across the desolate plains, the hot sun burned the pioneers. That says that the sun, S-U-N, is advancing or walking across the plains. But it's not, is it? It can't. So we have to change the order of that sentence. Advancing across the desolate plains, the pioneers, closeness, right? It's right next to it, were burned by the hot sun. Do you see the difference? Okay, awesome. Let's try this out. Let's try out number one. So some of these say the animals were five, some say the child was five, which is right, and some say the mom was five, right? You see, now that you know what you're looking for, you're like, wait, that's very obviously wrong. So what, which one is correct? B, B when I was five, that very much is, is straightforward, right? But A, my mother, bless you, at the age of five, that's saying the mom was five years old, right? I don't think that's possible. Um, and then C says the animals were five. They may have been, but I don't think that's the intention of the writer, right? So we know without a doubt, B has the modifier in the correct place. So let's look at two. This is one of those limiting modifiers. So think, where do those words go? Can you eliminate, um, are there any that you would eliminate immediately? B. B. Oh, there you go. Awesome. I, I was thinking I would eliminate C and D immediately because those are, you know, you're providing, um, you're giving inanimate exam. objects the ability to take action, which isn't true. Um, so we know it's so the fact that you guys eliminated B, which is fantastic. So you know the right answer is A. a absolutely. I have only one hour. Only there's modifying one hour. I think Look at the word only. Yeah, I know. So according to the English language, which is so complex, and, you know, it really is, and some of the rules make sense and some don't necessarily, uh, especially if you know other languages. A lot of other languages follow a pattern for almost everything. We have more irregular formats than regular, uh, more things that go against our standard rules, right? So only is a word that's categorized as a modifier. It modifies something, it describes something, but we know that in order to modify something and to make it clear to the reader, it better be really close to what it's modifying. Right there, it's saying, if we look at A, only is right next to one hour. That's what it is. We're, we're saying, how much time do you have? An hour. Right? Well, I only like only me. Yeah, you can think of it like that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, but if you can just remember, if you see the word only. only, make sure it's not in front of a verb like have, right? Make sure that it's right in front of like a thing. Um, okay, let's look at number three. So this is a participial phrase one. So when you read something with a participial phrase and you know it's a modifier question, ask yourself who or what is doing this? And the answer to that question should be what comes as close as possible to that phrase. <coughs> Bless you. What do you think? I put 
I put C. You put C. Did anyone else put C? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Who's always enthusiastic? Julie. Now, you know what? The peers may have been. I might be too. But the statement of the sentence, we know the sentiment is correct. And the modifier is correctly placed with C. If you've taken the test, you probably, you might remember, uh, the first few questions are about modifiers. You'll likely have three questions on modifiers. I know at least one is going to be a participial phrase one, maybe two. That's the most common one that you're tested on. But likely you'll have one on each of those three types. But remember, read the directions. Modifiers, they're close to what they're modifying. The second skill within this competency about structure has to do with parallelism. Concepts... You hate it? Yeah, you hate like parallel. Who hates parallelism? I like you can like hate it. cilantro, but <laughs> hating parallelism. <laughs> I love cilantro, but um, so parallel things match, right? Think of parallel lines. They align. If I tell you I love reading, writing, and to run, then yeah, say, yeah. what is wrong with you? Like, first of all, I don't love running. No, I love reading, <laughs> writing, and running. I love to read, to write, and to run, right? So all of those follow the same pattern. One isn't more correct than the other. As long as they match, it's important, right? So if you look at the top of page two, abused children commonly exhibit one or more of the following symptoms, withdrawal, rebelliousness, restlessness, and they are depressed. So we have items in a series separated by commas. Withdrawal, rebelliousness, restlessness. They are depressed. They are depressed is an independent clause. That's just a fancy way of saying a sentence. That's not parallel, right? You have a single word and then you have a whole sentence at the end. You gotta change that. Abused children commonly exhibit one or more of the following symptoms. Withdrawal, rebelliousness, restlessness, and depression. Do you see the difference? Okay. Take your writing utensil you have and circle the comma that comes after restlessness. Does anyone know what that's called? <laughs> the Oxford comma, yes. So when you have items in a series, there's a comma that appears before the word and or or, whatever that conjunction is, right? <laughs> Who needs it? Who says we need it? I'm sorry. Who says we need it? We use the Oxford comma. Who says, no, I don't use the Oxford comma. We don't need it. No one? That's good, because we use it. <laughs> Definitely use it. Hi, welcome. Would you sign in and just have one of those papers? Bless you. We always use it. So that's a little teaser for competency three, but we always use the Oxford comma. So whether you're writing your essay or you're answering a question about it, we always use it. It's not optional. Okay, let's look at number four. This is an example of parallel structure. I remember this from the practice test. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. So I tried to pick what people had questions about so that we could talk about it with, with broadly with everyone. <laughs> See if I got that on the actual exam. <laughs> See if you got it right? Yeah, I'm here. Well, I, I took it this morning. If you so. got it wrong, then you got it right, then I'm done. Because you got it wrong when I taught you something. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I'm going to get things. <laughs> Number four, what do we think? Anyone have an answer? C. C. Anyone who said C, which is correct. How did you get to C? Anyone want to tell us? Do you ever look at, you know what I do? I don't know. What were you going to say? So sometimes when you have items in a series, it's as easy as it was in our in our example sentence, right? Withdrawal, rebelliousness, restlessness, depressed, depression, whatever it was, no, right? Other times, it's not. There are other words a little bit more complex, a little bit more difficult to decipher, right? So when I see sentences like that, I write out where that first part of the sentence ends and where I can plug in all the examples, and then I try it with all of my answer choices, right? So if I'm reading this, I'm like, okay, it says my cousin mows the lawn, wash. Okay, so I'm thinking my cousin could be like the stem, and everything that follows every comma could should extend from that. My cousin mowed the lawn. My cousin washed the family cars. My cousin cleaned the up. You see what I mean? So then I'm going to just follow that same pattern with all four answer choices. My cousin, he collapsed on the sofa. 
I mean, eh, it's not wrong, but it doesn't follow the same pattern. My cousin, he was able to collapse on the sofa. Now, again, it's not, it doesn't follow the pattern. My cousin collapsed on the sofa. So far, that's my choice. My cousin was collapsing. Well, nothing else said was mowing, was this, was that, right? So for me, I'm going to say C is the best. When I see those parallel structure sentences, and again, the directions are going to say, oh, shoot, I deleted the directions. I'm so sorry. They're going to say, choose the, choose the answer option that provides parallel structure. It's going to say parallel structure. I'm so sorry to leave that. Um, so when you see that, I want you to think parallel. Things have to match. For me, I look at the answer choices and try to find something in the sentence that aligns or runs parallel with it. That's how I think the easiest way to answer these questions. What, what's your question? Uh, what's the answer number three on the other page? Oh, number three was C. Okay, thank you. And so we know four is C as well, right? So parallel structure, um, it might be words in a series like that separated by commas. That's going to be your clue. You're going to look at each item and make sure they all match, right? It could be that something at the beginning of the sentence and something at the end of the sentence have to match. So I used to have an example in here where um, it, it said something like, to accept false criticism is to give up, right? Which is, I hope no one does that. Um, so you might have to say to accept, and then it might say giving up. To accept was to give up. You just want to make sure that when you're looking for parallel structure, it might not be items separated by commas. It might, but it might not be. So look throughout the entire context of the sentence to figure out what, what am I trying to find a match for? Because that's what parallel structure is all about, right? Like finding a match, something that runs along, follows the same rules. And you'll probably have two to three questions about parallel structure. The third skill in the this competency has to do with um, identifying and correcting fragments run-ons and comma splices most people are pretty good at recognizing a fragment you can look at it and say i know this something else bless you is needed here right a run-on most of us can look at it and say okay this what is happening here like if i read this out loud i can't breathe any longer like there needs to be punctuation something's going on here a comma splice might be a little bit more difficult to decipher but is there anyone here who can describe what a comma splice is because if you know what a comma splice is so? You want to tell us? No. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, then we'll everyone will learn together, okay? So we just said, um, we were talking a little bit about independent clauses, right? So that's like a sentence, a simple sentence. Who went to teach elementary school? Um, yes. <laughs> awesome. So when you teach, especially the primary grades, right, we teach children to write in a series of simple sentences. They don't necessarily know yet how to use punctuation marks. So if your student turns in a paper and says, my name is Lindsay. I like puppies. Pink is my favorite color. My mom is awesome. Um, whatever. I'm just thinking of my daughter's future. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's okay because they're learning, right? They haven't yet learned how to take a more complex view of the language. Who wants to teach high school? What do you want to teach? Uh, economics, government. Okay, so then something in the social, and you want to teach high school too? No, special ed. Special ed, okay, fantastic. What, you want, what do you want to teach? <laughs> math, okay, awesome. Math, math, what do you want to teach? Physical education. PE, awesome. So even if you're, you're not teaching English, you will likely have some sort of writing assignment for your students, right? We know that's really important reading across the curriculum. There's a, you know, the state of Florida just introduced that there have to be reading competencies and endorsements in a variety of programs because if you have difficulty reading, how are you going to do a math problem? That's a word problem. If you have difficulty reading, how are you going to understand rules to a, a, a game or a prop? You know what I mean? Um, so if you're... 10th graders or 11th graders turn in an essay that says, my name is Lindsay, period. I like dogs, period. My favorite color is pink, period. You're going to say, let's advance your, your use of the language here, right? So we need to update our language. So if I say, my name is Lindsay, that's a simple sentence. It's an independent clause, right? It can stand alone. It can stand alone as a sentence. And if I say, I like coffee. That too could stand alone as a sentence, can it? <clears throat> what some people do is they put a comma right there. So I put a comma between two independent clauses or two simple sentences. What comes before that comma? What? That comma like, is amazing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I promise. So. <laughs> so 
what comes before that comma? That's a, that's a sentence, right? What comes after that comma, that perfect comma, by the way, is also a sentence. We cannot join that with a comma. That is called a comma splice. We've spliced that sentence down the middle and it's wrong. So if you're taking the test and you see that, right, you look and you're like, oh my gosh, this has a comma there. What comes before it is a sentence and what comes after it is a sentence, that's wrong. That comma is not a strong enough punctuation mark to join two full sentences together. So what can we do? Well, we can turn it back into two sentences, but I think Pearson knows we've all graduated from elementary school. So it's rare. I don't really think we're going to have that option. It wasn't on my section of, or my version of the test that I took. And I have yet to hear that that would be an option, right? So that's, that's not an option. Another a way that we can keep that comma, but strengthen it is by putting a dot above it, right? And we can turn that comma into a semicolon. A semicolon is a strong enough punctuation mark to join two simple sentences or independent clauses together. You need nothing else, right? So if you look at that and you say, my name is Lindsay, that's a sentence. I like coffee, that's a sentence. I can join them together with a semicolon. Let's say that's not an option. That we're looking, that's not one of our answer choices. Another thing we can do, did anyone ever have a teacher who taught you this acronym? You. Fanboys? <laughs> so those people who know it, um, do you remember what they stand for? No. And more. It's like sophomore year high school. Kind of. Yeah, right? Uh, so I want to make sure we know this is not because this is important. Okay, so FANBOYS is an acronym that stands for things called coordinating conjunctions. You don't have to know the name of it. But basically, there are words that we can put with that comma to join two sentences together to avoid having a comma splice. So I can say, my name is Lindsay, comma, and I like coffee. The test is difficult, comma, but I will study. Right? So... We have two independent clauses or two simple sentences, right? If we see them join with a comma, we look and we're like, oh, there's a comma in the middle. What comes before it? That's a sentence. What comes after it? That's a sentence too. You cannot retain just the comma. It's not strong enough. So what can we do? Well, we can turn that comma into a, a semicolon. That's a strong enough punctuation mark. That's fine. You need nothing else, right? Or if that's not an option, you can take that comma, keep it, but we have to add a fan voice to it for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so, right? One of those words. You don't need both. You need only one of those options, right? Um, I say not because, because if the word because is there, that makes the second part of the sentence dependent upon the first and you no longer need the comma. So basically just remember that if you use the comma, it needs to be one of the fanboys that join those two sentences together, right? Um, because once you use the word because, you negate the use of the comma, which is a different rule entirely. We don't even need to worry about it because it's not something that the GKT points to in terms of testing you, except to recognize, have you recognized that but is the word that we use, right? So we can either keep it like that. My name is Lindsay Semicolon. I like coffee. We could keep that, go back to a comma and just insert the word and right there. Right now, if you're like, oh, Lindsay, I took the test and, and B said to add the semicolon and C said to add the comma plus the word and it didn't. I'm telling you it didn't because neither one is more correct than the other. So relook at your answer choices. There might be something that we're missing, right? Like maybe a weird comma or spelling error or something later in the sentence because one is not more correct than the other. And remember that if you haven't done your essay yet, right? So when you're writing your sentences, you it's, it's okay to have some simple sentences, but we don't want an entire essay comprised of nothing but, you know, subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object. We want to have some complexities there. Um, so maybe throw in a semicolon once. Does that make sense? So a comma splice. If you look at a sentence, did you see a comma in the middle? And what comes before it could be a sentence and what comes after it could be a sentence? You can't retain only the comma. You gotta do something a little bit more advanced. Um, so let's look at um, page three, number five, and this is gonna test it for you. What was number four? Oh, I'm sorry, C, I think. Yes. I 
I kind of did this to trick a little bit. What do you think it is? So some people say C, some people say D, some people say B. You know, I told you like, oh my gosh, they're never going to give you a period and have it split into two sentences. Unless that's the right way. I don't think they're going to do that, but that that is an example. So I put that there intentionally to make you have you recognize that is so one possible way, it. right? <laughs> Caleb got it right. He goes, they probably got it wrong, but it's B. Very good. <laughs> so let's look at them, right? If we no one said A, right? That would be a run on if we chose A. Yeah. We need some punctuation. Let's look at C. C provides us with a semicolon. But if we look, that only works if what comes before and after could stand alone as sentences. If I say their comma will always be tomorrow's help wanted ads, that comma makes that semicolon wrong. You see what I mean? You don't need that comma. Just pretend, like put your finger over that first part of the sentence where it just says their comma will always be, mm, that doesn't, you wouldn't say that, right? Not with the comma there. It's not necessary. So it's wrong. And we definitely need to change it because as it stands, it is a comma splice, right? Because what comes before and after that comma could stand alone. So the only correct option is to split it into two sentences, as our expert Caleb has shown us. What's it called, like, how in this sentence, how they have, like, don't despair between the two commas? Isn't that called something? I can't remember. Like in a positive? Like you can pull it out. If you see something like that, where it's like you have a comma surrounding each part of a phrase, you, and you can usually kind of pull that part out of the sentence and read it without it there, and it would be fine. Like if none of these positions appeals to you, there will always be tomorrow's help wanted ads to investigate. And if you see that, that's kind of a clue to make sure there's a comma on either side of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Isn't it kind of weird though to end a sentence with despair? Like don't despair. It sounds almost yeah. like it's mid thought almost. I did find that kind of weird. I don't think it's weird, but I don't know that. I don't know. It could just be a preference. You I know what I mean? It's independent yeah. by itself. So that's why. And I was like, I saw on C that there's a comma after there. So it's just like, eh. Right. That's good. And, and yeah. so if you're going through and you're looking at options, you're like, I don't think that comma's right, but the rest looks right. No, it's wrong. Like if there's something about it that's wrong, it's wrong. Don't try and talk yourself into a wrong answer. I've done that. You know, you look at something. Well, they probably meant this. No, they didn't mean that. They meant it to be wrong, right? Um, yeah, so B is correct there. You'll probably have, again, two to three, depending on the version of the test, you have two to three sentences about run-ons, fragments, and comma splices. And my money's on comma splices. You're going to have to recognize how those work, right? But you all know now. Um, the fourth and final skill within this competency of knowledge of language structure. So, so far we've talked about order of words in a sentence, right? Um, and where a punctuation mark falls within that. Now we're going to talk about order of sentences in a paragraph because that's our structure too, right? If you have sentences and they're not in an order that makes sense or that's what Pearson defines as logical, then the reader might not understand what you're trying to say as the writer, right? So there are essentially eight different ways that we can, um, patterns we can follow when we organize sentences in a paragraph, um, eight common ways, and they're all listed there for you. You know, if I'm talking about something that, like a past, present, future, I'm going to talk about it past, present, future. I'm not going to get all crazy and talk about like 1800 and nine. If you were teaching uh, your American history class, you're like, let's talk about, you know, the Civil War, and then let's talk about oh, the you know, whatever. Like you're going to go, go in back. order, right? Yeah. Thank you for finishing that because I was going to, I don't even know what <laughs> I was going to finish that with. Um, if you're reading your paragraph and you think, you're like, oh my gosh, it looks like they're giving instructions, like step-by-step -step instructions. That's called sequential, like a sequential pattern organization. And so what often happens is we'll get, we'll have to insert a sentence or figure out the order. Don't put the cart before the horse, as they say, right? Like read it logically. 
um, spatially, if you're reading your paragraph and it's talking about geography, typically we, we, when we organize something spatially, we either go small to large or large to small. Doesn't matter. One isn't more correct than the other, but we're going to go in order. Now, this is not going to be the social science 612 exam. So it's not going to be something we wouldn't understand. But if you say, hi, how are you? Um, there's a sign-in sheet over there and some papers to pick up, and we are on page three. Um, but if you say, you know, Tampa is in Hillsborough County, which is in Florida, which is in the United States, which is in North America, right? I mean, that's something that is, I don't even want to say general, but, you know, so we went from small to large. We can also go large to small, but we're not going to mix it all up. Um, if we are comparing and contrasting something or talking about advantages or disadvantages, we want to group those together, right? So all of your advantages together and all of your disadvantages. So if you are trying to figure out an organization or where to insert a sentence, figure out, is this part of the advantage or part of the disadvantage, right? Six and seven are also similar. Um, if your paragraph is in um, kind of introducing a cause and then an effect or a problem and then a solution, Make sure that you have all of the problems described together before you introduce the solution. Make sure the entire cause <coughs> is presented, bless you, before you give the effect, right? And then the final um, pattern of organization is topically. So if you've ever written an outline, which most of us have, and you're trying to, like, if you do that for pre-writing, you know, um, and you're talking about, oh, these are the um, best things about being a college student, and you have it's, everything's about that one topic but then you have specific details about it make sure that the in, the specific details are with the related content right does that make sense so all of this maintains true not only for your english language skills section but for those who have yet to take or pass the, the essay section when you are writing your essay many of the topics are compare and contrast advantages and disadvantages we want to keep them together, right? If not, it's, the, it's confusing on the reader. The point is, of all of this, is when we read something, we want it to be well understood, right? And we don't want it to be challenging on the reader. Do you ever read something, you have to read it like six times, and you're like, what in the world? And then do you ever read something, and you're like, wow, that was really well written. I really understood that. Typically, it's very well organized. So let's, let's try number six. So what do we think? C. D. <laughs> F is right. Yes. Well, okay, here's the good news. Everyone knows it's not the introductory sentence. We know it's not A. We know it doesn't come before sentence one, right? And everyone knows that's not a concluding sentence. It's not the conclusion. No one said D, right? So we're deciding, okay, does this <laughs> sentence seem to make sense after one or before three? All right. Um, for those who chose B, which is the correct answer, why did you choose B? Let's hear some rationale behind why you chose B. Because right after the, the, the second sentence, it kind of changes subjects. And it also gives you a clue when it says, like, when there was no relief from increasing human tax policy, that made a rebellious group. So that will make sense to them as he is explaining where the facts they came from. So without that that sentence before it, it we haven't been introduced to the concept of that, uh, right? So it's like, wait, you're giving an explanation. You're saying, wait, hey, um, there's no relief from this. Well, when the heck did you talk about it? You know, so we need it there. This is essentially a chronological thing, right? So we cannot explain something if we haven't introduced it yet. So that's why B makes sense. What do you think? Well, <clears throat> since I saw Caleb, that, you can argue it wrong, but you're wrong. I, I know, I know. <laughs> but mm -hmm. since I saw because of sentence one that uh, was chronological, I thought it would make sense to be D because the sentence is talking about after the war, 
Okay. So it'd go after all of this stuff. I could <clears throat> I could see how it might be a concluding sentence, right? But do you think that it makes better sense? To introduce it rather than, you know, have you ever read something and it says like, however, it's like, well, what are you even, what's the counterpoint you're making, right? If you're giving an explanation, we probably should introduce it before we give it a little bit more detail on it. Does, yeah. Do you understand why it's B? Yeah. Okay. You just wanted to say, look, I'm, I'm not an idiot. This is what it could be. I don't think you're just kidding. You're dissing everyone that picked D. That's yeah. all. Oh, to... I know. I thought yeah. you said C. No. <laughs> okay. I won't, I won't diss you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. It's B. The answer is B. You got it? Yeah. So it it, it bridges the gap between one and, and, and three, essentially, by putting it there. And it introduces what's what's discussed as it stands in question or in sentence two. All right. Um, okay, so those are your first 10 questions. The entire competency one. So you'll have about three questions on modifiers, two or three on parallel structure. You'll have about two or three on um, essentially comma splice recognition run on fragments. And then you'll probably have um, one or two related to how you'll get uh, the patterns of organization. You'll get a sentence um, or uh, I mean a paragraph and then a sentence and figure out where does this go? Where does this logically make sense? Um, so I say two or three, two or three, because depending on the version of the test, one might have three questions on skill two and two on skill three, and the other one might be vice versa, right? But it's, it's basically two or three questions on each of those. That's your first 10 questions. Then we move on to competency two. The second competency also has 10 questions. And this is knowledge of vocabulary application, right? Um, oh, look what I did here. I screwed up. Number nine, we're, let's go straight to number nine because that should be in competency one. This is the first time I've used this guide because um, I tried to change it. But let's go to nine because I was like, I thought I put a question in there about that. So sometimes patterns of organization are going to be presented in a way where you read a paragraph and they give you a sentence and they say, hey, put this in where it belongs. And other times it's going to ask you to figure out which sentence doesn't even make sense. Like, why should I kind of remove this from the passage? So let's jump to number nine because that I'm so sorry about that. I'm so sorry, number four. Page four. Page four, number nine. Let's read that. So when you get a question like this and you start to read it, ask yourself, what's the main idea? What's the point, right? What is my main topic I'm addressing with this paragraph? And you should be able to identify a sentence that, although related, doesn't address the main topic. It'd be like that sometimes. These long paragraphs sometimes I just like check out in the middle. I know. It's just a lot just for one question. So here's a clue it's not D. If you're thinking it's D, it's not D. D is not necessarily as, as strongly related as others, but it is related to the concept of support of um, teacher educators and that trajectory that that looks like. So it's not D. Anyone have any guesses? What do you think it is? I'm thinking A too. Think A, what do you think of A? Oh, wow, guys, okay. <laughs> Alexis is right. Um, C is the answer. 
So let's look, you would see as well. Let's oh look God. at number eight. Like, <laughs> once in the it's classroom, crap. developing yeah. teachers should find professional development activities on their own. Why'd you pick that, Alexis? Um, because the um, paragraph, it talks about like support system. So basically saying like on your own, it's like coordinating. Like, Everything else is talking about how we can support these yes. pre-service <laughs> educators, the teachers, students, while they're students. And that's like, look, figure it out. <laughs> awesome job mm -hmm. so the other i mean i can i agree with you all like i can see how the others aren't like suit like but that's the point right so we're they're not going to give you something where it's like spinach is green like something that's completely unrelated so ask yourself and that's a really good point alexis when you're going like a really good um way of looking at it when you're going through if you're like shoot is it this is it that is it this think about the main idea think about the main purpose how can we support teachers, pre-service teachers, teachers once they're in the profession? Oh, well, this says figure it out on your own. So there might be some um, overarching concept or topic or main idea that one sentence just doesn't address. And I get it if when you're reading these sentences and you're taking a, an exam that's time and you're like, okay, I just kind of tuned out. And unfortunately, we've got a lot of those on reading, right? But um so think about what can you do to maintain the focus, knowing that it's one question. Let me just get through this. Or if you know that that's one that's struggle for you, mark it and move on. You know what I mean? Don't allow yourself to ruminate over it. Answer it to the best of your ability and move on. And if at the close of your exam you have more time, then you can revisit it, right? Um, okay, so I apologize for going out of order, you guys. But now we're going to go back to uh, competency two, knowledge of vocab application. Vocab is, um, you know, one of the most difficult things to teach because it kind of is something that we've learned over our entire lives. Um, but we don't have, you shouldn't make flashcards, don't make flashcards. I'll send you a list of some um, common words that you'll likely see, but I don't know if anyone's ever encountered something where, like my sister, one of my sisters, when she took the GRE, she made like a huge stack of flashcards and she took the test and she was like, I don't think one of those 500 words was on there. Now, maybe they were, maybe they weren't, I don't know, but she wasn't learning the words. She was memorizing the order of flashcards, right? And so if they got out of order, she was like, I don't know what that word means, right? Or if it was a slightly different meaning, then she was super confused. Instead, we should use context clues to help us make our best educated guess of what the meaning of a, sense of, a of a word might be. Use root words, prefixes, suffixes. What words does this sound like? So that maybe we can identify what might be a good match for that. Um, so let's let's just give it a shot. At number seven on page four. You know how I asked earlier how many of you like eliminated answer choices right away? Does anyone do that when you take an exam? You cross through answer choices. That's a really good strategy to do because um, it does kind of trick our brain into thinking that, that questions are easier than they are. Um, it's like, oh, I don't have four choices. I have only two choices here. Um, it complicated directions. It's totally the answer. So you're, yeah, you're getting, yeah. I wish every professor gave me complicated directions, right? So we know it's not complicated and we know it's not why. So we can eliminate A and B immediately and then allow our energy to focus on deciphering which one of the two might it be. So if you're like, okay, this is cool. I have no idea what they mean. Then um, you are not alone because a lot of people encounter that. Some people have told me when, and I use this example all the time, and I continue to because I, a majority of students who have taken the test who have recalled the words that are on it have told me these two words remain on the exam. Is that true? Yeah. Yep. What, these two? Succinct and verbose. Yeah. So. I think I remember this question actually. Oh my. So succinct. <laughs> And verbose are actually antonyms. They mean the opposite of one another. When you see the word verbose, does anyone think of a word, anyone who knows the meaning of the word, think of something that help another word that sounds like it that helps them to remember it? What do you think? Verbal. Verbal. A lot of people have told me that they think of verbal when they see verbose. Absolutely. Verbose means expressed in more words than necessary, right? So if someone's verbal, it's like, oh my gosh, be quiet. Right? Like, you know, we've all probably met people like that, like going on and on and on. Verbose essentially means that. You went on verbal, just kept talking, kept going on and on. 
Whereas succinct, and I almost think like your mouth does this, like when you, like it's so quick when it says it, right? Succinct, concise, expressed in few words, right? Short, concise, or concise. <laughs> succinct, <laughs> concise are, are synonyms, right? So when we're reading this question, the students wish that Professor Jones gave a certain type of directions, right? But instead, they're pages that are chock full of requirements. The assignments are verbose, aren't they? But the question isn't asking us to define verbose. They're saying we wish to is the opposite of that. So the answer here is succinct. C, express briefly and clearly. It's concise. It's succinct versus verbose, verbal, expressed in more words than necessary. So if I were you, I would highlight star, put a little heart there, draw a winky face. Those two words, I'm betting you, are going to be on your test. Um, throw one in your essay. Maybe they'll be like, hey, this person really knows what I'm talking about. Um, but I get it. So sometimes we might encounter words we don't know. I'm going to send you all. Um, so Jordan sent you up the practice test. If you didn't have an opportunity to take that already, um, please do. If you did take it and you have questions that you don't understand why you got questions wrong after this is over, chances are I'm going to bet you're going to know why now. Um, but if you don't, then we'll talk about it. I'm going to send you all a PDF from that book. It's REA is the publisher. We think it's like probably one of the most in line with the actual exam. If you're a USF student, you have access to it for free through our online library. Um, it, you might have that. Um, and also, I'm going to send you a PDF of the chapter um, for things called drills. So drills are not questions that are formatted like the actual test questions. Instead, there are ways to, in, like um, matching and multiple choice and those types of things for vocab, right? Just to quickly kind of familiarize yourself with words that are likely going to be on the exam. Uh, again, I would I would advise against doing flashcards unless that really works for you because I know that can be time consuming and really frustrating if at the end of the day none of those questions is on your test, you know. So go through the drills. I think that's probably one of the best ways to do that for you uh, or for you to improve in this section. Let's try number eight, another example of vocab application. Spent like two minutes on this one on the practice exam. I didn't like this one at all. You didn't like it? No. Sometimes words have meanings that are different from the ones that we most commonly associate yeah. them with, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I got that one right, but I didn't like it. <laughs> I'll check. Just for the heck of it. I missed that one. And I missed it again. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Caleb, what is it not? Bless you. Bless you. Uh, it's not relented. It is not relented. Relented means that you're like abandoning something that's cool. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, ah, I'm getting away from this. It's, I'm not, I'm relenting that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if that makes sense. You might have a certain way about like a, something the accident or the incident that happened, but you're conveying something to an insurance company, right? right? You're not relenting it, you know, abandoning something that's cool. So that's not what we're doing. So we know it's not B. Did you pick relented both times? I picked renounced this time. Oh, so we know it's also not A, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. renounced um, <laughs> means that you're not. like formally it's declaring not. your abandonment. Yeah. If you renounce what? something, you're like, I, I renounce I you're, this. Oh, I knew, but when we, you're like a different... Uh, definition. I was like, well, if it's that, it could also mean something. Did you think like announce, proclaim? Not really. I'm trying to give like, other words that might sound similar. But renounce, you know, for some reason, I think of like royalty. Like I'm feeling like I've watched some sort of like movie where a king or a queen was like, I renounce this. And it means that they're like formally yeah, abandoning something. Oh my gosh. I thought that it was like <laughs> announcing. Because it sounds like I it. think it that's does. why they picked that. Because it does wow, sound like it. That's tricky. It? So we're not going to renounce anything to the insurance company. We're not going to relent anything. Um, related. Related. Related is correct. So yeah. related, we know, could mean like you <laughs> are, you know, like a family member to like someone. Like really. That's what I Oh, my God. But instead, it's like that. to give an account of something. You're relating something to someone else. You're relaying it, related. So related <laughs> means to give an account of an action or a situation, related. 
Um, reserved can mean a couple of different things, but um, one meaning of the word reserved is that you're slow um, to reveal emotion or your opinions if you um, are reserved. Also, it can mean like to set aside for a specific purpose. So that one, I have a feeling if anyone has taken the test recently, you might remember um, having to know the meaning of the word related in this sentence and this meaning, you know, so give an account of something. Put aside by that one. <laughs> yeah. You're narrating it. Think of the narrator is the relator. Um, okay. So let's um, skip to page five. The second skill within vocab, because the first one's just straight vocab. Right? Like it's just here. What is this definition of this word? The second one has to do with commonly confused words, uh, words with multiple meanings. <laughs> you don't think out of you got a majority of No, right. I said the stationary. I remember oh. that. Example. Yeah, you remember it, right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> where exam. is the nearest stationary store? Well, that's not how you spell stationary in that instance, right? You can spell stationary that way. It is a word, but it up, doesn't mean actually. that. You did look it up? Yeah, because I didn't know what stationary with the E is. <laughs> okay, so there's two ways to spell stationary, right? So we can spell it oh my god, <laughs> stationary, <laughs> and we can spell it. It's like arts and crafts type thing. Stationary, <laughs> right? So our difference is here, isn't it? The A and the E. <clears throat> if I'm going to a stationary store, what am I going to buy? What do you buy at a stationery store? Paper. Paper, office supplies, things like that. So, like, if you have a pen pal, you can go to the stationery store and buy paper to write that pen pal a letter, right? Versus the other meaning of the word stationery, which means immovable, right? Like, if this chair is stationary, it's not moving. This is a stationary object, right? It's not. It's on wheels, but whatever. <laughs> the way I remember this is... I write a letter with an ER on stationary with an ER. And stationary with an A, don't write this in your essay, that ain't moving. <laughs> right? So I write a letter with an ER on stationary with an ER. Stationary with an ER means essentially paper. Would you right? say that that word is going to be on the test? Okay. <laughs> I think so. If you've taken it, do you remember seeing that? And sometimes we don't remember, remember cuz we're like I didn't even know there were two different words, right? Like I just thought it was whatever. Um so that's could be that's one example you might see. Anyone confuse um Yep, and then and then affect all and those. No. So, um Gets me every time. <laughs> oh, I'll get you with that. I'll Effect. Get you. Yeah. So, anyone ever read Any Edgar Allan Poe? Yeah. And you know that poem he wrote about the raven, right? Do you remember that? I don't know if I don't remember all of it. I just know he wrote a poem about the raven, right? Mm -hmm. So, if effect and effect are confusing to you, I want you to think about Edgar Allan Poe and the raven, and I want you to write the word raven, but write it like this, right? So, I just wrote raven in a weird way, right? And it's an uh, acronym. Remember, affect is a verb and effect is a noun. So when you are trying to choose in a sentence, oh, um, ask yourself, is this like an action? Is this something that is taking an action? If so, it's a verb, right? And so we have to use <laughs> affect with an a or is it like a person place or thing like a noun like the effect of this treatment is that you're groggy right cause and effect i can always remember that cause and effect is with the e right um versus um this coffee is affecting me a because it's giving me caffeine and energy so the effect is anything that has to do with action. So like, that's a good example. Um, I was affected by waking up early, something yeah. like that. Wouldn't that be E though? Because no, of the no. cause and effect? The, like the cause the effect. <laughs> you could say the effect of waking up early is um, that I was affected 
by oh. and you would spell it two different ways, right? So if you can remember Raven and just think, okay, ask yourself, is and don't try your best to not overthink it, right? Is it a verb? If it is, then you use the A. Is it a noun? Well, then you use the E. I know. And time and or then and then, right? Yeah, okay. that's <laughs> so we have two different ways to spell this word, and they have two different meanings, right? Well, maybe there. Then and then, right? So than with an A indicates a preference. I would rather be studying than sleeping. Yeah, right. I'd rather be sleeping than studying, right? But the way I can remember the difference is then with an E has an E, and so does the word time. Okay, when I was in college and my undergraduate degrees in uh, journalism, and we I took a class where we had to memorize, like week one, was A through D in our style guide. Week two was E through G. So we had to know every single rule about everything, right? Like commas, conjunction, everything that you can imagine. So I would come up with these weird things that might not make any sense to you, but I remembered forever that time has an E and so does then. And then has to do with time. I'm gonna study, then I'm gonna pass. Because both have to do with something that happens in a period of time, right? Like then insinuates this happens, then this happens. Whereas than is a preference. Like, I'd rather do this than that. Um, I guess you could say A could be like an alternate, right? Like, oh, let's do this instead. Alternate than. I just made that up. I don't know if that works. But that's just one I'll, way to think I'll about it. I'll steal it. All right. That sounds good. <laughs> uh, we can do one more that I think you guys might find on there. Compliments. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So compliment and compliment, two different ways to spell that word because it's two different words, two different meanings, right? So one means to give praise. I'm going to compliment you. Like, oh, you are a, a wonderful singer or you have, you're a great writer. Another word means to accompany, right? Um, so your um, exuberant nature really complements your significant other's um, reserved demeanor, right? Your hair color complements your skin color, right? They go well together, they accompany one another. Um, so the way I remember that is I think, you know what? I like compliments. So compliment with an I means to give praise, right? Like, oh, I like compliment. Whereas compliment like this is it's the first complete. part of the word complete. And so they go together. See, when you have to learn all these things, you come up with these weirdo things to remember, but I've remembered them for 20 years, so maybe you'll remember them for a month. <laughs> yeah. um, when is the second one used? If you say something about something is a compliment of something else, like um, my um, the reading specialist who comes in compliments my instruction um, because she helps the students understand the importance of uh, literacy as it relates to social science or something. It goes together. It completes it, right? Um, your earrings really complement your shirt. They go together, don't they? Um, your A lot of times it's it's making a comparison. You're saying two things go really well together. Right. Well, like the chair complements. Well, that is, a, that is a compliment. If, okay, so you, what is it? I could say your earrings complement your shirt. I just gave you a compliment, two different ways, right? Because saying your earrings complement your shirt, what did I say? They go well together, don't, didn't I? I didn't, I, I could think they're hideous, but I didn't. I mean, I don't, I think they're lovely. <laughs> but I didn't. What I said had nothing to do with my opinion of them. All I was saying is they complete one another. They accompany one another, right? If I say, I like your earrings, that's giving you praise and, that praise, and that's a compliment, right? Um, does that make sense? Okay, so I'm gonna send you all a list of the most commonly confused words, but the ones we just went over are ones you're likely to encounter. Oh, compliment, I just remember that because I like compliments. Like, who doesn't like to get a compliment, right? To get praise, if someone tells you you're so beautiful, are you gonna be like, you know what, people just need to stop telling you that. <laughs> no, so I like compliments, you know? Yes. Oh, okay. well, guess what? Yeah. That's, oh, yeah. That. Look at you. I could have placed you. That's our number 11. So let's, let's, um, 
let's answer number 10 and then we'll do 11. Oh, I didn't explain it. Let me, let me give you this brief thing for this chart. So sometimes in here I put little charts or things that are bolded because it's like a nuance of the rule that I think is important. Sometimes we use a certain word or phrase when we can count or measure something. And sometimes we use a certain word when it's ambiguous. So if I said to you the amount of people in this room, that's wrong. Because we can count how many people are in this room. So I have to say the number. The number of people in this room. The number of students in your class. The number of hours you spent studying. The amount of time you spent studying. The amount of effort you put into preparing. Right? Do you see the difference? So if you can count it or you can measure it, you use number. The second set there is fewer and less. So let's say you go to Publix and you're buying three things. You go into an aisle and the sign above it says 10 items or fewer. Should say fewer, yeah, right? And I think sometimes <laughs> they are changing, but if we can remember 10 items or less, remember, like a lot of times in the store, I think I was saying earlier, I think that's like even a TV show 10 items or less. Remember that sign? Remember that it's wrong. <laughs> because, well, I mean, not, let's just think that if you are, I mean, how many times have you seen signs that are wrong? Like sign manufacturers are just manufacturing the sign. They're not analyzing the things on it, right? So just remember, they just got it wrong. They're the messengers. Yes, they're the messengers. They're, that's not their message. They're just putting it on a, a piece of plastic to hang up, right? So if you can remember 10 items or less, remember it's wrong. We can all count to 10, right? 10 items or fewer. You have fewer students in your class than I do. You've spent fewer hours studying than I have. You've spent less time studying. You're less prepared than I am. Sometimes if you flip it, it makes sense. It makes sense because you wouldn't say you're fewer prepared than I am, <laughs> right? You wouldn't say that. So sometimes you can plug the other one in, and it'll help you. So if you can count it or measure it, you use number and you use fewer. The final pairing of words is farther and further. So let's say that Caleb's like, "Oh, Lindsay, it's so cool the way that you're just like bashing me when I got something wrong." So I really want you <laughs> to like come and do a study session with me over and with other people in my classes. And I'll say, great, what's your address? And I take my phone, I type it in, and it's going to give me the exact mileage, right? I'm going to know exactly where to go. So let's say you're like, oh, this is, and I'm like, oh my gosh, 74 miles. Oh, that's far, right? I can measure it. So finish the word, far, farther. If something is farther away, if you live farther away from USF than I do, I know your address, I know my address, I know you, USF's address, right? We can measure those distances so we use farther, right? It's like right? a comparison for that case versus further we wouldn't be able to measure right so yes i can see how that's a comparison but you wouldn't i don't know if that's a, a safe thing because if i say you're further along studying than he is that's a comparison to it but we can't measure that how do i measure how far right i can't right i can't yeah. even say that so it would just be if you can measure it if it's a distance you're trying to go somewhere right there's a location you can tell me how far away that is, far, farther, versus you're further along studying than I am. Does that make sense? Okay, so now that I've explained that, let's answer number 10 on page five. Caleb, if you get this right, it's testing two that you were confused about. I also had a question. Mm -hmm. um, well, after. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what do we think the answer to 10 uh, is? B. B. B, yeah. If you tell me to pick up a box, of supplies, you better tell me where I'm going, right? <laughs> and then um, van, right? I got that one. Yeah. Comparison, yeah. right? That has nothing to do with time. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Let's look at number 11. Capital. How do we spell capital? <clears throat> See, isn't that like capital, like the capital building, and then capital with the A is like the city? Isn't it something like that? <laughs> what do we think? What do we think 11 is? A, absolutely. So Caleb was saying capital like A-L, that's a city, right? Capital with an A-L means city. Anyone in here who wants to teach young children and you teach them how to write capital letters, capital with an A-L also means the letter. Hey, when you teach economics, you might talk about capital gains, right? Capital with an A-L also means currency. 
So capital with an AL has three different meaning, meanings. It can mean a city, it can mean a letter, and it can mean currency, right? A city, letter, and currency. That's all AL. But capital with an OL is a word. It's a building. And Jeannie, our boss, remembers it by saying, oh, what a beautiful building. Because then she remembers the O is in, in capital when we refer to the building. So I can say, I went to the capital city to see the capital building, and I've spelled capital two different ways correctly. Right? Because the city is A-L. The only time you use O-L is for the building. Oh, what a beautiful building. Does that make sense? I think in like fourth grade I did a project on the Capitol building. Y'all didn't think of building in Washington, D.C. And I did that and I remembered learning how to spell it. But then I, for some reason I think I thought you always spelled it with an O-L or whatever. So the answer to 11 is A, capital, A-L, because we're talking about the state capital city. All right, so those are the first two um, skills within um, that competency. So you'll have like three or four questions on that. One straight vocab and the other is like the commonly confused words. The third um, and final skill within this competency has to do with diction and tone. So that's how we're saying something. Oh, hi. Um, so, you know, if I asked everyone in here to tell me whether your thoughts on whether um, – a standardized exam spoke to your ability to be a highly qualified teacher. We can all, we might all agree that the answer to that is eh, probably not, right? So we can have that same message. But if I ask you to talk about it in here, you might say it one way. If I say, you know what? I need to identify a delegate who can speak to the legislators in Tallahassee about the importance of finding an alternate way to, to identify te quality teacher candidates, right? The message might be the same. You might say a standardized test is not accurately, or you know, it, it doesn't convey whether I'm a quality teacher. The words you use to say it and the formality that you choose will differ depending on your setting and your audience, right? And if it doesn't, it's not the point isn't going to be made as clearly or taken as seriously. So some of the questions related to this competency are exactly that. You're going to be presented with a situation or a scenario, and you're going to be asked to identify what's an appropriate closing line to a speech or opening um, phrase to a letter or something like that, right? So when you get to those questions, I want you to think of this. Who's the person who's speaking or writing? And what is that person's relationship to the audience, right? If I'm speaking to my colleagues, to my peers, I can use language that's familiar within our industry, right? If I'm speaking to kindergarten students and I start using words that are like incredibly formal and advanced in vocabulary, I've lost them, right? If I'm in a pep rally or a lunchroom, I can be casual, maybe even a little bit humorous. If I'm at a national conference, or I'm giving some sort of formal speech, I need to think about that the same way I think about like an academic paper, right? It has to be formal. Uh, so I want you to think about the person who's speaking or writing, the relationship with the audience, and the setting that they're in. And that should help you dictate the formalness of what you're supposed to say. There was a question on the test that it was like a guy writing, or no, a guy um, presenting something to like, a, like I think elementary school. Uh-huh. And that one was tricky. I don't know if when you guys take it or if you guys took it, you saw it. But that one was a little tricky because he's talking to, like, younger people. So it couldn't be, like, so, what is it, eloquent? Right. So. If I were thinking of that, I would think of the audience as five-year-olds. And I would think I need to be as casual yeah. as I can be. I think I put, like, <laughs> one of the options as, like, he was like very um, professional yeah. in the way that he spoke. So I think I got that one wrong. Well, and and so you, but you're, you realize now, well, I have to think about the setting, right? Yeah. That's so important. The other way that this skill is tested is recognizing, you have to recognize wordiness or being verbose versus conciseness or being succinct. Yeah. Effective writing is concise. Remember that when you're writing your essay. Remember that when you're taking the exam. Don't take 14 words to say what you can say in, say in seven, right? Be straightforward. Nobody likes succinct. filler words. Hmm? Nobody likes filler words. Right, exactly. You've just kind of 
muddy the point of what you're trying to make. Unfortunately, sometimes we are given assignments that are word counts quantified <laughs> like that. Yeah. And so when we've said what we can say, we just kind of go back and say, have I said, um, however, therefore, da, da, da. and it's like, we don't need all of that, right? Effective writing is concise. So in some sentences or some questions, you, you may be able to identify a couple of options and think, those both are grammatically right. Choose the shorter option. Effective writing is concise. So if you look um, at the bottom of page five, the medical exam that he gave me was entirely complete. I can shorten that sentence, right? Often we use the word that unnecessarily. We don't need the word that in that sentence. I can just say the medical exam he gave me, right? Remember that when you're writing your essay, if you go when you go back to revise, check the word that. Check yourself and say, do I really need that? Often you don't. And if I say entirely complete, what kind of definition of complete do I have if I think I need to use the word entirely? Complete is complete, right? So I can change that sentence from the medical exam that he gave me was entirely complete to the medical exam he gave me was complete. Effective writing is concise, right? Um, Page six at the top explains what we were kind of talking about. When you think about the person who's speaking or writing, the audience or the set and the setting and taking that into consideration when making a decision. Slang is never appropriate. So don't use words or phrases that are um, not proper grammar. Um, colloquialisms or phrases that mean things only to certain people um, are wrong. Like, um, if I say, I, I used to have a question here, but if I say something like, oh, my students are the cream of the crop, that's wrong. Don't say that because not everyone understands what cream of the crop means. I might take that literally, right? If you know what I'm saying, chances are you have grown up in the United States and that makes sense to you. One time I had a student who had recently moved to the United States and she said, what does that mean? I'm like, oh, it just means like the best of the best, that cream rises to the top, you know? And she's like, oh uh, yeah, just say best of the best, right? <laughs> and, and that's true. When we're writing or we're speaking, we want to speak in a way that doesn't discount any members of our audience just because of cultural backgrounds or geographical locations or anything like that, right? Um, and uh, so we want to remember, don't use slang, don't use colloquialisms. Pearson dictates that we should not use humor in formal settings, right? So if you are reading and you're like, wow, this setting looks pretty formal and there's options that include humor, don't choose them. If it's a kindergarten class, you can, right? That's not a formal setting. It's, it's I mean, I'm not discounting kindergarten classrooms. I think that there's a lot of important things happening, but it's not a formal setting, right? Um, so let's let's try this out. Let's look at number 12 on page six. Think about the rules we just talked about, and that should help you eliminate at least one. Then there might be confusion about some of the others, but we'll walk through those. What can we eliminate? As to weather. As to weather. We say simply weather. Uh, we can also eliminate if there was ever something where it said whether or not. The or not is implied, so we never need to say that. Now, it doesn't even have to be in that order. You can say whether you study or not. You don't need to say or not. So if you get to a question and you see the word whether, I want you to go through your answer choices, and if you see the word not, cross it off automatically. It's wrong. You don't need to say that. Whether is simply whether. Another pairing of words just along those lines that I want you to be cognizant of, reason and because you don't use them together, right? So if I say the reason I haven't passed is because I didn't study, I've been redundant. And we just learned effective writing is concise. It's succinct, right? So because if you look that up means something along the lines of for reason that. So if I say the reason is because I've said the reason is the reason, right? So if you are taking your test and you see the word reason and you look at your answer choices and you see the word because, I want you to cross through those. They're automatically wrong. So if you see whether, you don't need as to whether, you don't need whether or not. If you say reason, you need simply reason. You don't need because. So we know the answer isn't B. So now we've got into all of these pronouns, me and I, her and you, she and him, all that stuff, right? Now that's part of the third competency, but I introduced it here because I think um, it's important for you to 
recognize and remember that you might see some overlapping questions of different skills being tested in one question. Um, so when I, um, I used to play this song, it's kind of funny, but um, when I was in middle school, I think two songs came out around the same time. One said between you and me, and one said between you and I. It's like, well, which one is right? So Celine Dion, her song said between you and I, and I thought Celine Dion, she's like this classically trained vocalist. Like when I think of her or look at, she's very like, I would think that her grammar is probably correct, right? Versus the other song that said, it said between you, uh, me and you, but the point is you're using the word me there, right? Um, was by Jaw Rule who's a rapper. And if you listen to rap music, most of the time you're not thinking, I bet they had a grammarian look over these lyrics, right? <laughs> like it's not necessarily going to adhere to proper English grammar. But guess what? The rap music was right. It's always between you and me. And the key to that is the word between. I want you to remember that when you see the word between, it's between you and me. If you get rid of the word between, that rule of no longer stands, okay? So... So that means we've now discounted. Is this real life? Okay, get me out of here. I'm just trying to, I want you to, this might help you. Okay. So let me get through this ad. So if you get to a question, you see the word between, I want you to think of this song. Anyone ever heard this song? Yeah. So if you get to that question, remember this song. <laughs> Between me and you. So don't watch the video in front of children. <laughs> <laughs> what? Six. <laughs> Austin, our English ed major. Um, so if you see the word between, I kind of remember it because there's a lot of E's and me has an E between you and me, you're always going to choose me. So now we we know that it's not A, and we've already eliminated B. It's redundant. It's verbose. We don't need to say that, right? So now we decide, is it I or me? That helps us decide what the answer is, right? For that, if you get to where you have a pronoun, it's the last word of your sentence, right? I, me, he, him, she, her, right? What I want you to do because effective writing is concise. So not everything that the reader intends to be expressed in this is said. Some of it is insinuated, right? So I want you to say out loud, maybe not out loud when you're there, but out loud right now, what is implied? So if I was reading this sentence, I would say, between you and me, I don't know whether you should be first or I should be first. Now let's plug it in the other way. Between you and me, I don't know whether you should be first or me should be first. <laughs> when you say it like that, there's not a, there, there's no question, right? Everyone here knows that the answer is I. Or, so the answer is D, right? We keep, we retain I. Let's pretend that that had us choose between he and him, right? Between you and me, I don't know whether you should be first or he should be first. Between you and me, I don't know whether he should be, you should be first or him should be first. Even you can just pull that last part of the sentence out. Would you say him should be first or would you say he should be first? We would say he should be first, right? So if you get to a question and you see those pronouns as the final word in your sentence, finish the part that's implied and plug in both options. And often that allows us to identify essentially if it's a subject or an object of the sentence, but we can usually just kind of hear what sounds right to that, right? So we know the answer to 12 is, is uh, D. Let's look at 13. This is the other way that diction and tone is tested. What do you think for, for 13? B. Yeah, a job interview is a pretty formal setting, right? So we want to avoid um, anything that's casual. And um, we also 
probably don't want to be a narcissist. <laughs> so, so, we know, <laughs> so we know B is correct in that setting, right? The person who's speaking is speaking to someone who's interviewing that person. The setting is an interview. We want to be formal. Um, all right. Let's look at 14, of which there are three things I'm going to point out that I don't like about it. This is the first time I've used this one, and I'll tell you what they are later, but or afterward. But I'll let you. They don't affect the correct answer, but I just I'm going to tell you things that shouldn't be here. What do you think the answer is? And what <laughs> clues you in that B is the right answer? What word in the um, question tells you that B should be right? Humorous. Humorous, right? Why? Well, I, I think humorous is part of it. That's why you can say sleeping. But activity, absolutely, the whole thing kind of lets you know that's what it is. Okay to use humor in that instance, right? But I want to point out, um, hopefully. You shouldn't use in that sentence. You should say, um, which is awkward. Um, I'm hopeful that it is hopeful, but hopefully in that instance is actually wrong. So if you see a word at the beginning of a sentence that says hopefully, comma, it it doesn't mean I hope that this happens or I am hopeful that this happens. It literally means full of hope. Hopefully she ran for office, like thinking she was going to win, right? So remember, we don't need this. Yeah, maybe I'm just using these as a non-example. No, I screwed up. So it's all these hopefully. Um, B, there's a difference between the word while and the difference be between while and although. And in this sentence, it should say although, not while. Um, those two words can be used. Sometimes people use them interchangeably, but they're not. So if you get to a question and you're like, huh, Answer choice, I have to choose between while and although, otherwise they're like the same. Ask yourself, is what's happening happening during a period of time? If the answer to that is yes, we choose while. If the answer to that is no, we choose although. So here I'm saying, while I enjoy many activities, my favorite activity is sleeping. Uh, that should be the word although. Compared to if I say, while I was studying, I got a little sleepy, so I had I got some coffee. While I was shopping, I bought a new hat, right? So while indicates something that's happening during a period of time. So this sentence should say, although I enjoy many activities. And C doesn't have parallel structure. I like sports, comma, bicycling, comma. And I mean, it's casual to say pretty much anything outdoors, but I would say anything outdoors. So anyway, the answer to 14 is B. And the importance of that is it's testing your um, recognition of the setting, the um, appropriateness and level of formality or informality, right? So that is all of competency two. That's your, that's your next ten questions. And you'll have three or four questions on each of those competence or each of those skills. So vocab, commonly confused words, and diction and tone, wordiness, conciseness are all wrapped into one, right? The final competency has to do with standard English conventions. These are things like pronouns, antecedents, verb tenses, subject verb agreement punctuation, capitalization, it's a lot, but each skill has only one or two questions. So if you can get these, awesome. If there's something that you're like, I don't know if I fully understood that. We said at the beginning, 72% is what a passing score is. 28 questions out of 40. So if you're like, Lindsay, I'm never gonna get that. You can skip it, right? You don't need perfection. So the first skill, um, asks uh, you to determine and select standard verb forms. So we were already talking about the intricacies of the English language and how we have regular verbs and irregular verbs. And um, you'll be tested on the irregular ones, of course. No one's going to ask you, you know, if I say, oh, I'm, I'm going walking. Oh, I, I walk, right? That's present tense. What did you yesterday? I walked, ED, right? Versus, oh, I'm, I'm drinking. What did you do yesterday? I drink it. We don't drink it, right? <laughs> so but that's what you're going to be tested on, are the, the past tense, typically, or present of irregular verbs. So I put some there to, to note, like seen, written, begun. You don't say, I saw it, I write it in, I begin it in. Um, so if you are unfamiliar with those, refresh your memory. I'll, you know, again, I'll send you notes. Um, but I do want to point out what I think you'll likely encounter is um, recognizing the difference between lie and lay. Right. So let's forget about the word lie in terms of the meaning 
to not tell the truth. If I lie to you today, I lied to you yesterday, L-I-E-D, right? That means to not tell the truth. That's, that will not, that version of the word I do not believe will be on any version of this test. But I do think you will see the other two. So if you see the word lie, L-I-E, that means to recline, lie down, right? Lie, L-I-E, to recline. Lay, L-A-Y, means to put or place. And you can see that I've put an asterisk there because it requires an object. You better put or place something somewhere, right? So lie to recline. I think those kind of sound like lie, recline, right? Lay, to put or place. I'm going to lay this bottle on its side, right? On the, whatever. I had to say I'm doing, putting something somewhere, right? So if you're having to decide between lie and lay, Ask yourself, is there an option? Are we putting something somewhere? If so, we choose lay because lay means to put our place, right? But if we're talking about to recline, lie, right? Which think about what you tell your dogs. Does anyone have dogs? You tell your dog to lay down? That's all I should be saying, lie down, right? Because that means to recline. Um, now, I put the past tense and the past participle, like past participle, what we use with a helping verb, like have. I do not believe you'll be tested on those. I believe it will be only the present tense, recognizing between lie and lay. Lie to recline, lay to put her place, and requires an object. So let's see if we've got it. Let's try number 15. What do we think? D. D. So we, that's absolutely right. We're not going to change it to lie because the papers aren't reclining. It's correct as is, right? We're putting or placing the papers on the desk. Um, if you've taken the test, you know that when you see that his or her or your or his or her there, that's a lot. You see that a lot, right? So if you encounter that, I want you to ask yourself, who is his or her or who is there? In this sentence, who is that referring to? The students. Students. Right? Plural. So what do we choose? We have to choose there. If it said, ask your student to lay, uh, then we would say his or her. But it doesn't. It says student, so we have to choose the plural, right? So um, interestingly enough, if anyone takes classes that require you to follow APA format, um, the seventh edition of APA, which is like a, another similar style guide to MLA. Um, the seventh version of APA just came out and it is accepting they there as singular pronouns, like you could use that. Pearson and the GKT does not follow that. So if you see your student, then you have to choose his or her because we don't know if that student is a his or that student is a her. And certainly Pearson is not as progressive to recognize gender nonconforming. <laughs> yeah, see, I got confused on this. I thought his or her. I didn't know it was like they were going to change there. I thought they were going to change to your desk. So I was confused. Oh, okay. So like technically that can make sense too. So it goes in order like. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So A is right. And actually on the test, it's underneath it. Like the A would be underneath the underlined letter or word. So you see how lay is underlined in that? When you're taking the exam, that letter A, like the actual physical letter A, would show up underneath the word lay. It wouldn't be in parentheses after it. I'm not adept enough to know how to do that. But that does that make sense? Okay. Um, so, and, and we know it's not UR desk, right? Um, and I... I mean, ask your students to lay their papers on his or her desk. But if I said, I already said your students. So par part of being parallel is maintaining the same pronoun throughout, right? So if I say your, same thing as when we're writing our essay. If I say your, I better say your later, right? If I say, um, you know, the students, I'm going to stick with the students later. Um, but that's a good point. I'm glad you bring up things like that because we have to make sure we look at all aspects of the yeah. sentence, you know? So, yeah. Um, so yeah, verb tense, you'll have a couple of questions about that, one, maybe two, and I bet one will be on lie versus lay. The second, um, I'm sorry, verb forms, the second skill has to do with verb tense. Um, I just want to, I put up every verb tense for you, but I just want to point out a couple of things. We use 
present tense if we're talking about like something that's happening right now, right? We also use present tense if we're talking about contents of literature. So if I'm talking about, if my sentence is, is addressing something that characters in a book did or actors in a play did, that's present tense, okay? That is, if you ever um, had anyone say, oh my gosh, you can like get lost in the book, like you love it, you just like feel like you're like living right along with the characters, right? And if you haven't found a book like that, that's unfortunate, I hope you can find one. Um, read and educate it. Anyone in here read Educated? Freaking, you need to read Educated. It is the Austin, it's Austin's book, I borrowed it. Oh, changes your life and your perspective on what having an educated mind can do. It is amazing. She, uh, I think it was Amazon's, num like they recommended it as the best book to read in 2018. And yeah, it'll, it'll change your life, it's awesome. Um, and read it and don't look at when it was published or how old the author is and try and guess. And then when you finish, look and you'll blow your mind. It's awesome, I'm telling you. Um, but anyway, read that as a, buy that book for you as a congratulatory present when you pass your vacation. Because um, I promise you, you will then tell everyone you know to read it to because that's what awesome I've done. Um, so anyway, if you're reading about contents of literature, it's present tense. Does anyone ever, you know, when you think about your living in the moment, you know, when I was a kid, my mom read The Cat in the Hat to me, and the cat is in the hat. The cat is in the hat. Right now, if I read that to my daughter, that cat is still in the hat, isn't it? <laughs> so present tense. Compare that to if your sentence is talking about when something was written or published. That's always past tense, right? So I want you to just understand the differences between the two in case you have questions on that. The other thing I want to point out has to do with if your sentence is talking about something that happened in the past. And then you're looking at your answer choices and you're like, oh, these are like all different forms of past tense. Like some are just simple, some are more complex, they have other words in it. What, what they're trying to test you on is your recognition of whether something had a definitive beginning and end. If your sentence is talking about an, an activity or an instance that had a definitive beginning and end, we use simple past tense for that, right? Because it, it's, we know that ended, it began, it ended, it's done. When I took the exam, I think it may have talked about Da Vinci and um, his art, and it was asking me to differentiate whether it sold or it had been selling. And I knew, okay, Da Vinci is no longer living. In fact, he's been dead for a really long time. So I don't think that the very first art piece that he completed was sold to one person and has never touched another set of hands. In fact, from what I know about art history, which is very little, I think that art actually trades hands often, right? So a museum will get it, it'll go to a traveling you know, exhibit, maybe some really rich people will buy it, right? So it's an action that began in the past, but it continued on after that, right? So that's an important distinction. For that, we use a more complex form of the verb. Um, and so to, I think, draw that or drive that point home, let's go to page eight and answer um, question 16. What tense was that that you were just talking about? The, um, past perfect. So past perfect tense is where you have something that began, I'm sorry, that ended and then there was continuing action. Past perfect. Thank you. I'm sorry. I should have said that. That's that's true. That's pretty sad. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I guess I would. I don't know that I would know 1850 and 1900. I think I could give you a right. general time frame. Yeah, just ballpark it a little bit. Yeah. Two thirds, though. <laughs> yeah. So, was this an action that began and, and ended with a definitive time frame? Or did it be, suggest something that there was an action taken in the past and there was continuing action afterwards? It was definitive. And if you're questioning it, there's literally years written there, right? So when you see that and you look at your answer choices and you're like, this is talking about verb tenses. What they're asking you is to define whether it was a definitive beginning and end or whether it was continuing action. For this, it literally tells you beginning and beginning and end, right? So what, do, what is the simplest form 
a verb that we could use because that's what we want to choose. B. Took place. Took place. Absolutely. It happened already. We can't keep it as is because it's not taking place, is it? Right? Um, so is taking place or takes place. So we have to choose took place. It happened in the past. C is is um, what we were talking about, past perfect tense, right? There may be remaining acts um, that show that maybe it ended and not everyone accepts that, right? Or, or there are still lingering unfortunately, things that occur, but that's not what the sentence is getting at, right? So look at it straightforward. So the answer is B. Does that make sense? The third skill is subject verb agreement. If we have a singular subject, we use a singular verb. If we have a plural subject, we use a plural verb. Um, where this might be tricky is if we have words that we don't necessarily know if they're singular or plural. If I say student, we know that that's singular, right? And if I say students, we know that's plural. Um, there are words that are called um, indefinite. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm losing my mind. Uh, indefinite pronouns. Indefinite pronouns. And they end in O and E or B O D Y. Everyone, someone, anyone. Everybody, somebody, anybody. Those sound like a lot of people, don't they? All of those indefinite pronouns are singular. So if you see those words, everyone. You put the same verb with everyone that you word with the word he, right? So if you get to a sentence and you're like, everyone, oh, and you say it out loud and plug in both words and you're not sure which one like sounds right, plug in he. He is singular, isn't it? You're going to be able, you, that's a word we use more often likely. And so you could probably pick it up just by ear to tell if that sounds right. Um, so those words are singular, um, the indefinite pronouns that end in one or buddy. If you look at the top of page nine, Here's another fun little chart of a, an intricate part of this that's, that you might see on your test. Well, we don't need to only learn words that are, come from English. We also need to know Latin and Greek origin. Because why wouldn't we? Absolutely, right? Um, I didn't write the test. So I just took it and I'm trying to help you pass it. So um, if I say, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a USF student. I'm trying to get into the College of Education. The only criteria I have remaining to get accepted is passing the GKT. And you're going to say, well, I can tell you why you haven't passed, because you don't know <laughs> that Ooh. criteria is plur oh, plural. Burn. <laughs> Who would know that, right? I don't know. <laughs> criteria is plural. The criteria for getting into the College of Education are earning a 2.5 GPA, taking your prerequisite courses, work, and completing all sections of the GKT. The one criterion and how often do we use that word that we, that's remaining is this, right? Um, has anyone ever met anyone who said, I'm an alumni of USF? Austin has these weird puns taped up downstairs. Like, what is it? The past tense of William Shakespeare is? What he was Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> he laughed for like a week about it. <laughs> like, okay. Future English teacher. But you know, so that I think is an interesting Dad. point. Oh. Austin and I both <laughs> love English. Love English, right? Dad. He is taking liter a lot of literature courses, loves it. Jane Eyre, he's talking about like young adult literature. He read Ready Player One. Like he is really, really into that, right? Yeah. I like the technical side of the language, right? I really love knowing what words go in what places where my punctuation mark needs to be, all of those things. So your English teachers have to take courses in all of these things, literature, fiction, drama, poetry, British literature, female, you know, women in literature, American literature, linguistics, grammar. How many grammar classes do you think a graduate of the College of Education, a secondary English education major, uh, completes as part of that degree? Grammar. Done. Ten? <laughs> Did you say ten? Yeah. Ten? Yeah. Yeah. One. So if yeah. we're going over some of this and you're like, huh, I don't know that I ever necessarily remember a lot of this. Your English educators, if they let's just add them only talking about ones who went through our program, took one grammar class because they have to take courses in everything. So you want to teach social science, right? So you and I don't know your program of study, but you have you could your certification allows you to teach psychology, American history, economics, um, uh, other histories, right? Like world history, sociology, psychology, Nothing world ideologies, family. right? So 
what he'll take is a broad spectrum of that. Think about elementary ed. You got to teach freaking everything, right? So your English teacher may have gone into the profession because he or she has an affinity toward the components of English like that Austin does. And we all know that what we love is what we kind of pour into our teaching, right? What we emphasize. We know we have to reach certain standards, of course. But I'm going to put more emphasis. If I were reading, you know, if I were teaching a class about literature, I probably wouldn't talk about it with as much excitement as I would about, you know, grammar. <laughs> Which that's just what happens. So I say all that to say, when you're going through this, if you're like, what in the world? How do I not necessarily remember all this? Maybe you weren't taught it or it was just not emphasized as much as some other subjects within English, right? But now you know it and you're all expert. Um, but if anyone ever says, I'm an alumni, ask them if they have multiple personality disorder. Don't. <laughs> Don't do that. But alumni is plural. No one, let's all make a, a pact right now that no one will ever say, I am an alumni. You are an alumnus. I am an alumnus. And if we really want to get all freaked out, we can look up the Greek because there's actually masculine and feminine versions. But Pearson doesn't care, so we don't care. So we're just going to look at alumnus, right? <laughs> so alumni is plural. Alumnus is singular. I am an alumnus. We are alumni. So you get, you know, I think I, I see things like alumni association. There's a lot of people in an alumni association. That helps me remember that it's plural, right? Um, data. Data are. These data are interesting. You would never say this data is, right? Now, again, I don't know how often we use the singular form, datum. So most often for these, we have to recognize that the plural is plural, right? We're never going to say data is. Media. So my undergraduate degree is in journalism. And when I chose journalism, I had to choose among a variety of different medias, like, um, or different mediums within the larger kind of Picture. umbrella of media. So I could choose newspaper writing, television broadcast, magazine. Now they have internet, which they didn't have when I was there, right? So all of those different forms. But the medium I chose was news writing. Hello, would you grab, um, sign in, you're right. You're going in the right direction. Over there on that, um, oh, yeah. Whatever the word for countertop, okay, is, uh, I promise I can help you learn words. Uh, and then grab one of the packets and we're on page nine. Um, but the media are, the media is, is wrong. The media are, right? And then phenomena, plural as well. So you wouldn't say, oh, I, I'm terrible at coming up with an, an example for this. But um, my when I took a, astronomy, my favorite um, phenomena was about shooting stars. Well, a phenomena is plural, so my favorite phenomenon. But if I made you say, Lindsay, you had me until this table and I'm leaving, we're done. I want you to cover up the left hand side and look at everything on the right. And if we can agree to, with one another that we'll never say I am an alumni because we know that that is plural and we can kind of mentally remove that word, every word on the right hand side ends in the letter A. So if you get to those words, Every word ends in A, it's plural. And if you want to keep alumni and you can just think if it ends in a vowel, it's plural. So if you encounter one of those words and you're like, oh my gosh, which one? If it ends in an A or a vowel, it's plural. Plug in the word they and figure out which verb fits with that and that's what fits with those words. Does that make sense? So let's give it a shot. Let's try uh, so it's subject verb agreement. That's what this is all about, right? Singular subject goes a singular verb, plural subject goes a plural verb. Let's try number 17. What do we think? A. Oh, I heard three options. Um, who chose B? B is correct. Excellent. Um, why did you choose B? Yeah, it's one fish. That's why. 
perfect. Oh, that's why you chose you chose one fish. Well, yeah. the fish is <laughs> the object, right? right? So if I say he, let's so sometimes I plug in he and this, nice. right? He is a singular subject all the time. They is a plural subject all the time, and that helps me figure out which form of the verb matches with what. So would I say he choked Guess. the fish or he chokes the fish? I would say he chokes the fish, wouldn't I? That's a terrible thing to say, but let's just say. So the, the S on the end of the subject makes it plural, <coughs> but usually the S on an end of a verb makes it singular. He chokes. What is the subject of this sentence? Plants. Masses. Thick That's why masses wasn't right. <laughs> of plants is a prepositional phrase, right? But even if you chose plants, that's okay. Let's say that you chose plants because that's plural as well. But masses, thick masses, that's plural, isn't it? So we have to choose the form of the verb that matches with that, right? Yeah. So I would say the thick masses of plants use up the oxygen and choke the fish. If you're confused, parallel structure can help you with this one, right? What aligns with use? If you, I say plants use, plants choke. That can help me figure it out that way. I'll plug in because I can't change both of those. So one has to be right. Which one is right? You know? And so if I isolate parts of the sentence, it can help you figure out. That's what you did? Yes. I knew it wasn't C, so I just kind of guessed. Yes. Quite from B and D. So, so I really think that the key is isolating the part of the sentence that you're looking at and understanding if it's subject, if you're looking at this, you know they're testing subject verb agreement, right? Because that's what we're changing, whether it's a singular or a plural verb. What, well, what is it? Is it singular or plural, right? If we make sure we can hone in on what we're looking at, and sometimes plug in he and they, that kind of helps me get the right one. So B for number 17. Let's look at 18. Remember that chart? Remember the right-hand side of it? That helps us know which words are plural. What's the answer? C. 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 Intentionally, I put that there because how many times have you heard someone say the media is biased? Right? Media are. Media is a plural word. I know. It doesn't sound right. It sounds a little bit awkward, doesn't it? But now you know. If you're taking the GKT and you see that word media, you're going to be like, it's the weird one. Well, that it's makes sense. Media R, right? I think that makes sense because it's like multiple companies and everything involved. Yes, so absolutely. I kind of think of it like everything that ends in A, think of R because R has A. Oh, because yeah. R is the plural form yeah. of the verb to be. That's good. I like that. Yeah. So if media is plural, Medium. Yeah. It's up in the chart. <laughs> that is really good. <laughs> I know. I think it's like it's the medium. Yeah, it is. Oh, perfect. Social media can mean Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat. Is TikTok a social media? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a TikTok, but <laughs> I'm not that cool. Um, or young. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, 18C. I, I intentionally put that there because I know that doesn't sound, it doesn't kind of just roll off, right? But if we know what we're looking for, it can help us when we take the test. A was tripping me up a little bit too. We, yeah, we do not so capitalize. I didn't think it was right. Um, so um, capitalization comes later, but that's an adjective that's modifying that type of election, right? Mm -hmm. Adjectives that are derived from proper nouns are capitalized, like um, languages and countries, things like that. But president... President isn't a proper noun. Okay. It's a, it's a, uh, a title, but we only capitalize titles when they come right before someone's name. We'll get to that. <laughs> All right. So the fourth skill is agreement between pronoun and antecedent. So where I, as you can see where I wrote the word when. When Chris sprained his ankle, Coach Ames replaced him with Jasper, a much slower runner. So Chris is the antecedent. It answers the question, who's him? Well, it's it's Chris or it's Chris, right? We always, we need to make sure that when we use a pronoun like him, that it agrees with whoever the antecedent is, right? If I said, when Chris and Austin sprained their ankles, Coach Ames replaced him with Jasper, 
then we wouldn't know who him is, right? It wouldn't agree. That doesn't make any sense. So we have to make sure that we know that they agree. So um, if you look on page 10, I put another little chart there of some pronouns. Who, this is important. We use who when we talk about people. So I'm never going to say the students that are in my class. Students are people, right? So we have to say students who are in the class. That's really the most important thing I want you to get from that. Um, so let's try this out. Pronoun and antecedent agreement in number 19. What's the difference of who and whom? Because I've seen that one a bit. Oh, we'll get to that. That's okay. a prone. That's a, uh, a pronoun thing. It has to do with whether it's um, a subject of a sentence or an object of a sentence. But I'll give you a try. <laughs> okay. What do we think? B. Anyone oh, here wait. not think B or D? It's, it's no, question. yeah. It's, 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 it's B because of the comma split. Or so comma decided split. to postpone the event until after the holidays is a sentence? Where's the subject? No, it's actually A, I bet. Yeah. What? <laughs> no, because it's like a group of people at the acting same as group. one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Board of directors. I missed it. It's That's a lot of people, good. isn't it? <laughs> but when you have a subject, <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you have a subject that is like a lot of people acting as one, like you treat it like a singular subject. Board of directors. Yeah, there's an S at the end of it, but it's a board of directors. It's one unit. Having its meaning, meeting one thing. I wanted to point that out because I think that's something that you'll encounter, right? So it sounds plural, doesn't it? It's not plural. This, so it we really have to doesn't use, even sound like it makes sense. The board of directors had its meeting. The board had its meeting. What if I said that and like took out all of directors? That help? So if you are, when you take the GKT, if you see a subject and you're like, oh, it's like a lot of people, but they're acting as one, the group is acting as one, treat it like a singular subject. The board of directors had its meeting and decided to postpone the event until after the holidays. We certainly can't choose B because that comma with the conjunction like that, with the fanboys works only when what comes before the comma and what comes after could stand alone as a sentence. And that doesn't pass that test, right? But can you repeat that, what you just said? Sure. So we can only use that, that construction of a, a comma plus a fanboys, right, when what comes before the comma could stand alone as a sentence. You could pull that out, put a capital letter at the first word, and put a period at the end, and you could do that also to what comes after the comma. But if I said to you, decided to postpone the event until after the holidays, period, yeah. you would say, that's a fragment. Let's see, that's a fragment. What's the subject? If I said... He decided to postpone the event until after the holidays. That's fine. But I can't just say decided to postpone the event until after the holidays. Does that make sense? Can you see how that's not a sentence? Like the first half can stand alone as a sentence, but the second half cannot. You get it? Like if you draw a line, um, not really. <laughs> so if I say to you, literally. Yeah, just cut it in half. Decided to postpone the event. Let's just say that's it. Is that a sentence? Decided to postpone no. the event. Is decided to postpone the event until after the holidays. Is that a sentence? No. No, it's not. You have to tell. Where's your subject? Who's doing it, right? So because it doesn't pass that test of having a full sentence before the comma and a full sentence after, you can't do the comma plus the fan voice. That only works. That works only when you have <laughs> a full sentence before it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I think you've got it. Yes. So hypothetically for this sentence, since it can't stand on its own, you could use a semicolon, right? Between that? No. No. That's the same rule. <laughs> it is? That's the same rule. So if you have a comma splice, right, where you mm -hmm. have a comma in the middle of a sentence, 
what comes before the comma could be a full sentence, and what comes after the comma could be a full sentence. The punctuation that's not allowed is the comma. That's called a comma splice. You've spliced that sentence in the middle. That comma isn't strong enough to join those two independent clauses right, but a together. A semicolon would, is strong yeah, enough, so right? Because you took that, that uh, comma and you put a dot above it. You gave it some weight, right? Mm -hmm. Or you added a word to it, a fanboys, and that helps you join them together. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. So a what sounds like a lot of people, or what could be a lot of people, but group acting as one, we treat it singularly. So that's how we know that A is the answer to that. So would you say that we would come across like a question like this on the test? No, I don't think so. So that's why I'm going to. Yes, I do oh, think you will. I do think you will. I absolutely think you're you will. Which, mess is with why, mind. which is why. You know what? So every it's question I put on here is either an iteration of a version from my test or like last time someone said, Lindsay, they're doing these questions where you have to look at a paragraph and pull out a sentence. So I was looking up examples for those because that wasn't on my version of the test. How do you remember all of this from when you took it though? Well, because I wrote it like literally the day that I took the test, I went back to my office and wrote it. And then I, I kind Still of good made memory, adjustments though. from them. 40 questions. Yeah, right. Well, I <laughs> didn't remember everything. But I remember. Well, and then I picked up the REA book. Yeah. And that looked very, very similar to the test. So I do think that um, there may be some not so ethical things going on with the publishers there, but I didn't publish it. I didn't do it. So I'm just going to oh. tell you to pick up that book, though, because it's going to help you. Which is what I'm Where can we you. find that book? Oh, I'll send you the PDFs of the uh, entire book. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody that. No kidding. <laughs> oh, you can just put it. There should be an envelope over there. Over here. I'm sorry. Here, I'll put it over here for you. Um, and if you want the key for the rest of them, just let me know. Just like send it because I'm gonna send an email, like whatever. And you can just write back and say, hey, I, I missed the last few questions. Can you tell me the answers? Okay. Yeah. okay, so the fifth skill has to do with pronoun shifts. There are different types of pronouns. There are pronouns that are called possessive. So it's like ownership, like um, our friend, my dog, right? Like that dog belongs to me. So the word my is a pronoun that's showing that possession. There's also a reflexive case. And this is what I want to focus on. When I think of the word reflexive, it sounds to me like reflection, like I'm looking in a mirror and I'm seeing myself. Yeah. Reflexive pronoun are words that end in self or selves, right? Myself, himself, himself. And if you look at the bottom of page 10, where it's bolded, we do not use the reflexive in place of the nominative pronoun. Now, let me put that in real people words. We don't use words that end in self or selves. That's the reflexive, right? As a subject of the sentence, that's the nominative pronoun, right? You can't say myself as the subject of a sentence. It doesn't work. And to put that into action, let's look at page 11 and answer number 20 at the top. So you two answer pretty quickly. What do you think the answer is? A. A. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what we just said. We do not use the reflexive myself in place of the nominative pronoun, which is the subject. If you get to a question where you have a compound subject like this, where it's something like two things joined by the word and, a trick to figuring it out is to remove the other person. Nobody cares about Randy. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. Your name's not Randy. I know. I couldn't put Kayla. <laughs> so let's take Randy out, right? Would I say myself plan to go or would I say I plan to go? I. I. Let's pretend like it said we had to choose between Randy and she or Randy and her, okay? Would I say she plans to go or her plans to go? She. She, she right? So take the other person out of the sentence. If you get a question like this, plug in both of your options and it'll help you figure out. Um, you know, essentially, if it's the subject of the sentence, which one to use? So the answer to 20 is A. There's also, like, no action done yet. So wouldn't you have to use the word myself after they do something? <laughs> yeah, so. But I promise you, you'll have a, a question that's asking, that's going to show you a self word, a, a reflexive pronoun as the subject. 
Oh, really? Yeah. And you have to know. They'll as just, long as you know, it's not a okay. Okay. They'll just trip you up the entire time. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. But you know it. You, you got it right in like three yeah. seconds. <laughs> okay, so the sixth skill um, is more about pronouns. But this one, bless, bless, bless you. you. Yo. <laughs> This one speaks directly to the fact that when we use a pronoun, like he, him, who, whatever, we better know who you're talking about. If we don't, if there's ambiguity, you've used your pronoun incorrectly, right? So if I say to you, I'm going to rephrase this in just slightly when I say it out loud. The mother called the daughter back to clean up her mess. I'm going to say this. The mother called the daughter to clean up her mess. The mother called the daughter to clean up her mess. Who is her? We don't know. The daughter. Oh, wait. Yeah, you're right. Oh, so it's not clear. It's the mother and the daughter. We don't know. So if that would be your answer choices, you would not choose that. We don't know. The mother called the daughter to clean up her mess. Well, is the mom a slob <laughs> who just thinks her daughter's going to clean them up? No. We can probably attest that's not going to work. <laughs> but, you know. Or is the daughter, right? We don't know. We have to be clear. So if we rephrase the sentence, we can retain the pronoun, her, right? When the daughter made a mess, the mother called her back to clean it up. You see, now it's clear yeah. who her is. So when you're writing your essay, if you're talking, for example, about like parents, teachers, and students, and then later you say they, and it's not clear, we want to ensure that your pronoun references are clear. Who is they? If you're unsure at all, just say the, the actual like noun again. Say parents again. Say teachers again. Say whatever it is again, rather than leaving it ambiguous, because we have to make sure the reference is clear. Does that make sense? So let's uh, let's try out number 21. What do we think? B. B. B, absolutely. Who is he or she? Student. Yep, a student. One person, so we have to choose that. Um, awesome. Okay, the seventh skill is we've talked about kind of the two main ways to make sure we get these right. Uh, it has to do with when we choose I or me, he or him, she or her, or as Caleb kind of gave us the exciting kind of uh, foreshadowing, who or whom, right? So the, the two main ways this will be tested is if the pronoun is the final word in the sentence, like it was for that example when I don't know whether you should be first or I should be first versus me should be first. We know it's I, right? Um, the other way is if you have a compound subject and you take the other person out. Would you say Randy and I are going to the store or me? Well, I'm going to say, I'm not going to say me is going to the store. I'm going to say I am going to the store, right? The, the tricky part, see when we take the other person out, it's like so obvious. We know the right answer. The one that maybe is a little less obvious um, is the comparison of the words who and who, right? Because sometimes like if, if you're like anything like I am, I kind of don't know. I think whom just kind of always sounds fancy. Yeah, and it's I don't like know snazzy that's really yeah, it, right? for some reason. Um, and that's not it. Fancy. So, you know, I've had students say, I thought it was just a preference, like whatever you want to use. And unfortunately, it's not, right? There's a purpose. Who is nominative and, and whom is objective, meaning it's the object of the sentence. If you get to a question and it says who and whom, and you have to choose between the two, I want you to forget about who and whom, and I want you to plug in he and him. And if he is the word that fits, then you choose who. And if it's him with an M, you choose whom. We can usually say he and him and figure out which one is right. And then we plug it in who and whom. And whichever one aligns with the correct version, that's what works. So he aligns with who and him aligns with whom. So would it be like to whom does this belong to? Like it belongs to him? Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when you say to whom it may concern, to him, yes, absolutely. That's a really good so way. Of it. 
You did. I'm sorry. So, then so like, boom is the only for uh, names for men? No, no. That's a real. I'm sorry. I should clarify that. No, I only use that because him ends with the letter M and whom ends with the letter M. You could use she and her and remember that she aligns with who and her aligns with whom, but I don't really think that has the same grab to it, you know? Um, so I only say that the male example, thank you for pointing that out, because of the M's, M and M. What about who's? Is that a real word? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard, I've heard that too. <laughs> to whom? We're all trying to learn real English. It's like, um, we're going to find out. It's like an extra plural of whom. <laughs> How would one spell whom? Uh, just whom and then S-T. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not a word. <laughs> But we know. But thank you for clarifying. Now we all know it's not a word. Don't write it in your essay, right? Um, well, I'm with, oh, I'm um, okay, so let's go to page 12 and answer 22 at the top. We're almost finished. Let me use my pencil right. <laughs> oh, look at me. I screwed up. Okay, what do we think about 22? B. B, absolutely. Students who, we just always use who when we're talking about people. I bet no one in here even thought that A was right because you took Gary out, right? And you're not going to say me saw the students. <laughs> me responsible saw. for is a pairing of words that's always used together. We never say responsible to, we always say responsible for. Another pairing of words, we always say different from. So you may have to choose between different from and different than. Remember that it's always different from. I just remember that because there's a lot of F's in that. Different from. Responsible for. So 22 is B. Um, the eighth skill is regarding adjectives and adverbs. So adjectives modify nouns or pronouns. And this is very simplistic, but um, ad adverbs modify verbs. And they usually end in L-Y. I want to point out bad or badly. Um, if I say, oh my gosh, you know, I, I heard that you didn't pass the test. I feel badly about that. Then say, Lindsay, what's wrong with your hands? Because you don't feel badly in terms of your emotions. You feel bad. I feel bad. You have not passed the exam. You never feel badly. That's always wrong if you see that. I will bet you you'll see that in your test. So you never feel badly. You always feel bad. Um, if you see the words sort of or kind of, those are considered slang. Um, so we don't choose those. We don't write them in our essay. Uh, instead, the appropriate um, adverbs we would use would be like rather or somewhat. Uh, but I point, I put it out there because that's what Pearson does. So like, even if you were like, doing a apology, you would say, I feel bad for how I was acting until you feel bad. Because mm -hmm. uh, that, that turns it like literally when it's badly, right? Yeah, it literally means like, what's wrong with your hands? Yeah. You feel badly. Did you burn your hands in acid and now you can't feel the fabric here? When you're talking about emotion, in terms of the word feel, and not meaning literal to touch, we use the word bad. It's Wait, just, so I'm, I'm really confused. So badly has to do with your hand all the time or you're just using it as an example? I'm using that as, if I tell you that I feel badly, so it's like I hurt my leg badly. Like mm -hmm. That's how you would use yeah, it. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, if we're talking about emotion, that's when we don't use oh, the L Y. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let's try this out. Let's do 23. And I'm sorry I didn't underline. I know I told you guys at the <laughs> beginning, this these are my guinea yeah. pigs. I didn't underline fantastic and terrible. So pretend like they're on the line. Or <laughs> Oh shoot! Or yeah. inexpensive. Well, how did I like see that when I look? <laughs> oh gosh! Don't write. Don't turn in any evaluations. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. 
What do you guys think? B. 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 Fantastic. Glee is an adverb that's modifying how it performed, which is a verb, right? Adverbs typically end in L-Y. So we're going to choose fantastically. Very good. Oh, that, yes, because it has, that doesn't have to do with your emotions. The only, if just remember this, if I'm talking about my emotions, how I feel about something, right? I feel bad. That's it. Strictly emotions, I feel bad. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Just you wouldn't say I feel goodly. We feel this kind of word badly is, but whatever, that might work. Uh, okay, the ninth skill, I think it's easy. Um, we have to, we use certain words when we're comparing two things, and we use other words once we have like three or more. The easiest one to remember is like between. If I say between you and me, first of all, we know we say between you and me and not between you and I, right? Because Ja Rule told us that. But also, there's only there better only be two people. Between is two. As soon as I add a third person in there, I have to switch to among, right? So between you and me, among all of us. If I, if Caleb, we're going to go for a race, okay? And you're going to yeah. beat, you, we run and you beat me. You're not fastest because there were only yeah, two faster. of us. You're faster. But if Austin joins and Austin beats both of us, he's, he's fastest, fastest. You're faster. I'm fast, right? If we're in a yeah. talent show. And you win, bless, bless you. you, you're not most talented because there are only two of us. You're more talented. But again, if Austin joins, once we have that third thing, most talented, more talented, talented. And one thing if that I thought was interesting that it was, I think is on the test. Let's say that I have two children. I have an older and a younger. I do not have an oldest child. Okay, so if you're talking about kids, even like that, we, we only that use ER when we're making a comparison of two. If you add a third, like if you have triplets, then you have an, an oldest, an, old, an older, and an old, even though they're probably Middle. minutes or seconds apart, right? Yes. What's your question? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Yeah. Sorry. Is among, is it U-N or O-N? Are oh. there two different? Oh, it's not like A -N -O -N -G, British. A-N-O-N-G, among. Okay. Yeah. Is there one with a U or now that It's like the old English. I've never, is it a word? Maybe. Among? It's like one of those. Or words. is it one of those where people just don't pronounce it right? It's one of those that, it's like color or flavor. I think. No, it's not. No? Okay. I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> so it sounds interesting. <laughs> yes. That works too. <laughs> How many kids do you have? <laughs> no, because you have only two. I well, that's what I I I, um, I, I saw that that was or someone told me they took the test and they were like, does that E R E S T thing work for kids? And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, if someone has two children, I said, yeah, it's older. You don't have an oldest. You have an older. <laughs> When there's three kids, it's oldest, yep. older. Just like anything else, right? Yeah. Just like anything else. Any, It doesn't matter if it's children, if it's people in a, a, a race, if it's a talent competition, if we're doing a, a strongest. But when you're youngest, why, why are they old? I'm because the rule is, two. if you're making a comparative statement, yeah. and a comparative statement is a statement that you're comparing two things. It's annoying. The appropriate okay. ending to that word is ER. So basically, we just talk about all the time. Colloquialisms, that yeah. is. Well, not necessarily <laughs> all the time. Ten items or less. <laughs> you, you know the way to solve it? Just be like, I, I have one kid. I say that's her. Yeah, that's your shit. <laughs> she's she's just this her. other one. I don't know. She's just here. Yeah, right. So, um, yeah, I just think we know we make. That's how it works, right? Now we know. So let's let's see if we do know. <laughs> On the top of page thirteen, <sighs> we're almost finished. So, um, okay. Okay, that's easy. Okay, what's the answer? B? B? Yeah, there are only two bridges. Mm -hmm. Okay, the 10th skill has to do with spelling. 
Um, again, note cards, not necessarily effective. I'll send you a list of the most commonly misspelled words um, and some of those drills. So I encourage you to look through those. Let's just test some. Look at number 25. Those, those answer choices at the bottom. <laughs> Durability. I love this whole system. Sis. <laughs> so what's right? Shields. C, absolutely, shields. What about 26? Uh, <laughs> what, did it break? Oh, oh, oh that's terrible. <laughs> she just got up to the bathroom and she's like, oh, oh no. <laughs> I'm going to head out. <laughs> Chair was not having it. So what's 26? A, right? Oh, it is B. No, it's no. not. Oh, you no? were right. I was? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Phenomena, phenomenon. No, Which I was one is me. plural? Which one needs more phenomenon. than one? Phenomenon. 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 The Grand Canyon is a singular no. thing. So it's correct as is. We don't change that. The Grand Canyon. I mean, I understand that's a lot, but yeah. It's resplendent. It's good. Yeah. I, I really don't I, even know I remember the difference that one. between the two. There isn't a difference between the two. It's because just this spelled isn't commonly incorrect. confused yeah. words. This is spelling. Uh, yeah. Resplendent yeah. with. D E N T, that's how you spell that word. There's it means something that's somehow. attractive or impressive because it's like bold okay. and colorful. Resplendent. So resplendent. <laughs> resplendent. Just look up, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so the one with the A and T is not even a word, it's just spelled wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's not like compliment. Yeah, exactly. Good comparison. Okay. It's not a commonly confused word, it's a misspelled okay. word. It doesn't even exist. It's like among with the U. <laughs> right? Oops. So the answer is A. Resplendent is how you spell that word. D E N T. Resplendent is not a word. That was my it's like some spelling word spelling. when I took the test. The southern slang. <laughs> so this skill, stay with me. We got like five more minutes. This skill is about spelling. It's not spelling in the sense that someone's going to stand up and ask you to write down words like we did spelling tests when we were a kid. Okay. But it recognizes our ability to, or it tests our ability to recognize it's wrong. that it's spelled wrong. Right? Okay. So A is the answer to 26. The 11th skill has to do with punctuation. We talked about the most important thing related to commas, and that is we use the Oxford comma. So, oh my gosh, Austin yesterday came in, two days ago, came in to talk about his frustrations with a professor. And he was like, she doesn't even use the Oxford comma. <laughs> I was like, okay, we're total nerds. <laughs> but that's the most important thing to think about with it, with a comma. In terms of a semicolon, we also talked about like what I think you'll be tested on most regarding semicolon, separating two independent clauses or two sentences. You use the semicolon for that. A colon is a punctuation mark you will likely not use in your test, right? So there are purposes for colons, um, but yes. it isn't likely something you'll encounter. I listed them all there. Apostrophes serve two purposes. Apostrophes stand in place for letters, right? So if I'm going to make a contraction and I'm going to change the words do not to don't, I put that apostrophe there and it allows me to condense that to one word. My advice is to avoid contractions in your essay um, because your writing is formal, right? So let's avoid contractions. The other purpose of an apostrophe, aside from standing in place for words, is to show possession or ownership, right? So if I say this is Lindsay's pen, I can't simply add the S to that, to the word Lindsay. Um, I have to put apostrophe S. The apostrophe S shows that it's mine, right? There's this chart here that's going to show you um, how to specifically place the apostrophe. So if you have a singular noun, like a car, I have a car, okay? And that car has a motor. The motor essentially belongs to the car, we'll just say. So that word car, the way that I show ownership or possession is I put apostrophe S, car's motor, Lindsay's pin, right? 
let's say that I have a plural noun that doesn't end in s. Like if I take the word child and I want to make it plural, it's not childs, right? It's children. Children is how we make the word child plural. And so for that, I do the same thing. I add apostrophe s. The children's mother, the men's room. One man is M-A-N, two become men, M-E-N, right? And so the way to make that possessive is apostrophe S. The final way to consider is a plural noun that ends in the letter S. So I have two dogs, okay? So if I say my dogs, it's D-O-G-S. In a basket by my door, I have their leashes and their collars, right? So if I say the dog's collars, and it's two dogs, that word already ends in S, right? Those collars belong to the dogs. They belong to me, but they belong to the dogs, right? I just put the apostrophe after the S that already exists, and I add nothing else because a plural word that ends in an S to make that possessive, the S is already there. All we need to do is add the apostrophe. So if I say one student's book, then I do S-T-U-D-E-N-T -E apostrophe S, right? Because it's a singular student. If I say have, uh, or the student's assignments, and I'm talking about 20 students, that word is plural. It ends in an S already, doesn't it, students? So I simply add an apostrophe after the S. Does that make sense? Yes, kid. Uh, so there isn't a thing where it's like S apostrophe S. Like, there is a thing like that. Okay. If you have a singular name, absolutely. <laughs> Let's say that your name is James, or my name is Bess, or Carlos, right? Yeah, Maybe you're Carlos, S. not me, right? <laughs> so that that is a singular person. It ends in the word letter S, doesn't it? Apostrophe S is how we make that possessive. That's a great question. So yes, James is. Yeah, like I, I remember like Jones's, where it's kind mm -hmm. of like that. Yes. So if you have a singular noun, so it's one person that ends in the letter S, to make that possessive, you add apostrophe S. We always follow that same thing. The rule says nothing about what the last letter of the word is, right? It simply says we add apostrophe S. So let's try this out. Page um, 15, number 27. <laughs> Singular because it's a group of people. It's singular. Right? I think so. So, how many bridesmaids are there? Three. There's three. It says it right there. How many brides? One. So, bridesmaids is a plural noun that ends in the letter S. Bride is singular. Both need to be possessive. So how do we do that? A. 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 Bridesmaids already ends in S. We have to make that possessive. The dresses are theirs, right? So we put the apostrophe after the S that already exists. The bride, it's just one. We want to make sure that um, we show that they're her sisters. So we add apostrophe S. Oh, sorry. Is if there's only one person that has apostrophe and then S? And then it's plural when you put it after. So the word bridesmaids, that ends in an S, doesn't it? Yeah. It's plural. There's, there's more of than one. There are three bridesmaids, right? Well, the dresses belong to them. So the point of one point of an apostrophe is to show possession, to show ownership. If the S is already there, we don't have to add another S. That just confuses it. We add simply the apostrophe. Does that make sense? Okay, what were you going to say? I don't know how to say this in a question, but... So basically, we put the S with the apostrophe at the end if it's more than one person. If it's already plural, more than one, absolutely. Okay, so... The S is already there. Because cars already has the S there, right? Well, if it's, it's my car and it has a motor, um, right? Then we would put car... Apostrophe S. Now, let's say I'm rich. I'm not, but let's say I'm rich <laughs> and I have five cars and I'm talking about their motors. And I would have an in. Then, if I said the car's motors, the S is already after cars, isn't it? Because there's multiple, it's plural. So then I put it after that, like dogs' collars, right? But because that sentence, in that sentence, the example that I gave, there's only one car. Right. So I just say car, it just says car. Okay, because so so, if we do um, dog's collar, we would put D-O-G-S. Say that sentence again. Dog. 
dogs. See? Dogs. What did what's the second Collars. one? Collars. Okay. So dogs collars. So if you say dogs collars. I don't need to know exactly, but it's more than one because you said callers, right? So do we have to put dogs and then apostrophe S? And no. Then, no? How many dogs are there? It's only a proper noun where it's Multiple dogs. Is. Okay, so the, the word already ends in S. Okay. Right? It's if it's easier. already stating that there's more than one, we don't have to put any other S. The S is there. You don't have to add anything. Your job is to add the apostrophe. Your job Only if is it's... Okay, so we add the apostrophe... If there's like in the same the sentence, if, if the same sentence is talking about more than one thing, and then in the same sentence it's also talking about one thing. Well, that makes I, sense? I gave you one question that addressed two different ways of looking right. at apostrophes. So I'm trying to think of like, okay, what if there's another sentence that has to do with just a singular thing? So if it said, how would um, we put it in a sentence? The dresses. What if we just said the dresses for the bride's three sisters? Okay, just forget that it says bridesmaids there. The dress is for the bride's three sisters or the bold. You can say that, whatever. I was just, I just went to my sister's wedding and I wasn't a bridesmaid, but I was still her sister, okay? <laughs> um, so then you maintain it, bride, because look at each part individually. So much of what we're doing for this entire test is kind of trying to isolate portions of sentences to help us like kind of hone in on a rule or a standard that we're trying to make sure this is abiding by, right? Okay. So the, at the end of the day, an apostrophe is going to show possession. If I have a singular noun, a word that's just one thing, right? Girl, dog, car, and I want to show possession, I add apostrophe S to that. If that word happens to already end in an S, like a name, James, Carlos, Bess, I'm still a singular person, so I have to add apostrophe S. The rule is if it's singular, I add apostrophe S, right? Think about what you add. That's the really the easiest thing. Singular, you add apostrophe S. If it's a plural word, but it doesn't end in S, like children, well, shoot, I got to add apostrophe S to that too. So, so far, I'm adding apostrophe S to both singular, the, well, I don't care what it ends with, and plural that doesn't end in S. That's going to get an S. Everything needs an S and an apostrophe. We just got to figure out. If it already exists, if we don't need to add it. Then if we have a um, plural noun, right? And that already ends in S. Dogs. Ladies. So we weeks. add the S with the apostrophe. The S is already there. <coughs> oh, my gosh. This is so confusing. So if I say two weeks, what I, if I said to you, oh, okay, I'm, I'm two week. Okay, no. The you S would... is already there. It says two weeks, right? Okay. So I just add the apostrophe because two weeks is plural. I think you're overthinking it. I think you get it. Did you get that question right? I did. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Okay, we're done. We're done. Okay. Does someone have a question about that? No, never mind. No, you're right. I don't want to stop you from asking. You know, I don't I was about to say, is, is, is the multiple and multiple things that you're adding on? Because multiple people that own this multiple. Yeah, that's a great way of thinking of it. Absolutely. But, of a group of people. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. No, but so oh, bridesmaids would be singular, singular, though, since it's describing the group, right? No. Or no. No. It's there because Wait, it's because that's why I picked it. Because I'm like, this is a group of people. Caleb, you've clearly never been in a wedding with multiple bridesmaids. Well, you think they're all wearing the exact same dress and the exact same size. You're I know, it's not my place here. It's not my place. <laughs> yeah, so their dresses are different. Right? right. It's three separate dresses. So how would you put like a sentence with um dogs collars? Like how would we spell that? D -O -G. So I have two dogs, and um, the dogs' collars are in a basket by my door. So it would go after dogs. Apostrophe would go after yes. dogs wearing collars. Because you know what we don't do? In apostrophe, we said the two things apostrophes do. They stand in place for letters, and they show ownership or possession. What they don't do is add plural to anything. So if I say, oh, the dog's collars, all we're doing for collars is saying that there's more than one, right? How we make things plural is we had the letter S, that's it, right? So we don't need an apostrophe with that. But have you seen people write on social media like, happy Mother's Day to all the great moms out there? And they'll write M-O-M apostrophe S. You can say moms what? Because you just said mom's ownership of something. You just say M-O-M-S. Oh, oh so parents. you only add the apostrophe S. Oh, my God. <laughs> you got it. I get it, I get it. I get it now. So you only add the apostrophe S if, it, if it's like owning something. Like 
a dress or yeah. everything's about ownership. That's what the apostrophe is doing. Okay, we'll go quickly through the, the very last, very last thing. Okay, and then if you have questions and you want to help me to help you with that, I'll sit. Yes. Capitalization. We capitalize proper nouns. We capitalize the first word of a sentence. These are not new things. We capitalize adjectives when they come from proper nouns. So if I say my English teacher, English is an adjective that's derived from a proper noun, so it's capitalized. If I say my math teacher, math is an adjective, but it's not derived from a proper noun, so it's lowercase, right? So Spanish, French, English, Chinese. Basically, if it's a country or a language, it's capitalized. Those are proper nouns. We also capitalize titles when they precede or come before a name. So if I say the email came from Dean Knopel, Dean is the title, right? Knopel is his last name. That title comes right before, so it's capitalized. Now, what do we not capitalize? Directions or seasons? West, east, no, nope, nothing is capitalized. If I say I'm driving north, awesome, great, don't capitalize it. Unless, of course, it's part of a proper noun like South Carolina, North Dakota, something like that, right? Oh, you know, spring semester. For the love of God, don't capitalize spring. We keep getting those emails. And I'm like, if I'm ever important, I'm going to make sure they're not capitalized. <laughs> um, we do not capitalize titles that do not directly precede a name. We already said what well, we do capitalize. Dean Knopel. That came right before his name. But if you say, Lindsay, I'm going to go get a master's degree so I can become a principal one day. Awesome. I'm not going to capitalize principal. But if you see, say, go see Principal Bennett, then I'm going to capitalize the P because, because it comes proper. right before his name. The same logic is used for that third thing. We don't capitalize relationships. Oh, I love my mom and dad. They're great. Yay. Great. I don't capitalize that, right? <laughs> um, especially if they're preceded by like the word my, yeah. right? And not used in place of or as part of a proper name. Because if I say my aunts and uncles are coming, that's lowercase. But if I say I think Aunt Lindsay is my favorite person, aunt in that case is kind of acting like my title, isn't it? Yeah. So I do capitalize it there. So it's, it's it, by sense? itself, it's lowercase, but if it's classifying something, yeah. I, okay. I get it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, 28. What do you think 28 is? Hey, absolutely. Uncle George, it's part of his like title there, right? Um, what if it said Spanish book? Would we capitalize Spanish? Yes. We would, absolutely. And then the very last one. A. Thank God. <laughs> okay. Um, if you have any questions, like I said, I'm going to email you um, with more information so you'll have my email address. Please make sure you, that it's right over there on the sign-in sheet. Drop off your um, evaluations, please. And if you want to take another one of these, a blank one, because there's more, take it. You could essentially use it like as a practice test. So if you say, like, I'm on spring break, you don't have to spring break. Good question. Does that make sense now? A little bit. Okay. So I think you've got it. I think you're just overthinking. Okay. So if I say, like, I was walking the dogs outside, 